what are a couple of foods you're talking about taming that body fat and working with those stem cells and helping them understand not to work against us? What are a couple of foods that you have found that are well, important there? So one of them actually is tomatoes. Um, the lycopene in tomatoes, so there's a bioactive called lycopene, it's a carotenoid, um, turns out that uh, found in tomatoes actually, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, do a lot of things to harmful body fat, to fight body fat. But one of the things it does, it actually uh, tames the stem cells. So it basically tamps down the ability of fat stem cells from going haywire. That's important. That's like sending that, 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 uh, crazy kid in the classroom who can't stop making noise and being disruptive, that's like sending him over to the principal's office, getting him out of the space, making sure he's not causing trouble. That's what well, tomato is one of them. Olive oil actually turns out, um, which contain lots of uh, bioactives. And I, I think that's what I'm so excited about as a research scientist. Not only is it the food, but we're beginning to identify the specific substance in the food that can be beneficial. So um, hydroxytyrosol, oleocanthin, all these types of bi bioactives uh, in in uh, olive oil, for, which is also present in whole olives, by the way, and and it's present in olive oil, but it's also present in olive water. Olives are mostly water, not oil. So when you press olive oil, it turns out that the the they they throw away the water right now and they they collect the oil, but the water's got a lot of these polyphenols. One of them, hydroxytyrosol, which also makes it into the oil uh, a little bit actually will tame your uh, stem cells in body fat. So again, this is an example where uh, the foods that we eat actually uh, not only surprisingly actually can help us fight body fat. I, that's one of the things that I was so surprised at when I started to set out to do this research. You assume that when you're eating food, you're going to grow fat eventually, right? Here, actually, there's actually substances in food that can actually help you tame and even lose fat. You know, in the premise of this book and in the introduction, you're basically taking the reader on a journey that you didn't set out to write a diet book. And it's obviously an anti-diet book, right? That's why it's called Eat to Beat Your Diet. Click in the show notes, by the way, pick up a copy. It's an amazing read. Everybody that listening on audio, on YouTube, please pick up a copy. And one of the things you saw from your first book is that people were eating according to the education that you put out there, which isn't about, sure, you get us excited about individual foods. Here's what olives can do. Here's what pomegranate juice can do. But you are not there to advocate necessarily for any one way of eating or any one food. You're just showing us the power of whole foods and when we include them in a good diversity inside of our diet. Now, the thing is that even though you didn't think that you were writing a weight loss book, a lot of people went on that eating program and style from the first book and they were reporting and they were writing into that, hey, like I'm not trying to restrict calories. I'm not trying to lose weight, but I'm noticing that I am losing weight. And that was like, that was really an amazing experience for you to have. Big surprise to me. And in fact, I'll, I'll confess something uh, that uh, most people don't know is that when I uh, wrote my first book and I turned it in, and it became very successful, New York Times bestseller. I had in the back of my mind a little concern that people would become so uh, enamored with eating all the foods that I talked about that they might gain weight. And you know, I'm a I'm a medical doctor, so I get concerned about this obesity epidemic. And I would be receiving these emails, you know, um, thousands of emails, tens of thousands of emails, people thanking me for writing the book, and then talking to me about how more empowered they feel and and how much healthier they felt. Uh, some people said, oh, you know, I was able to get off of my medications, you know, like I got lots of really good feedback. Uh, and I was, I was, but I was, my radar was on for people that might say, but I was waiting for the butt, but I'm getting weight, you know, because I'm eating so much of the good food that you actually are talking about. I never got that. What I got instead was I distinctly remember somebody wrote in and said, and you know what? The, the other the other benefit I got from eating uh, to beat disease is that unexpectedly I was starting to lose weight in ways that I could never lose before. And I got that one letter and I thought, well, thank God he didn't gain weight. And then I thought, wait a minute, that's a little bit weird. How could you be eating more food and losing weight? So I kind of brushed it off. And then I got more, maybe another dozen letters like that, uh, or notes, emails like that, people reporting that they were actually losing weight. And by the time I got to like 20 or 30 of these, uh, I thought, wait a minute, there is actually something going on. I'm a researcher, right? So we pick up clues by observing it. And I thought, what the most unusual thing 
is that by eating food, and these people are telling me like that now they're like really eating, uh, you know, foods to fight the five health defense systems. How is it that they could be eating food and losing weight? Um, and so that's what literally triggered me to begin looking more deeply into this. It was really just the next part of my research. Um, actually, I was doing research on metabolism, but I now I wanted to dive in to see what the heck was going on. And so when we started to take a look at the bioactives in these foods, because as a researcher, a scientist, that's what I'm wondering. Is there a mechanism? Like what could possibly be in these foods? The lycopene. The hydroxytyrosol in olive oil, lycopene in tomatoes, uh, the elagic acid in chestnuts. You know, um, I started to discover that in fact, all of these bioactives started to also make sense to me because they were fighting body fat. They were taming the stem cells. They were preventing fat cells from loading up with extra fuel. They were actually um, uh, igniting the brown fat. Uh, turning on that space heater to burn down energy and increasing metabolism. And then when you actually really took a look at the uh, studies that were uh, looking at specific foods studied in clinical trial, clinical studies, isolating the food, all right, and just giving the food to people, you started seeing that they, it was shrinking waist size, or waist circumference, and they were losing body weight as well. And so all of a sudden it became clear to me that there was this whole other field of foods that actually can activate your metabolism, burn down harmful body fat, and against what we I told, I, we talked about at the very beginning of this, which is this new science of the metabolism, these four phases and the harms of extra body fat, I realized that there was something that people had to read about, which is what are those foods that you eat that we know what's inside them can burn harmful body fat and unleash your inner metabolism. That was worthy of a book. So that's why I actually wrote this Eat to Beat Your Diet. And I'm so glad you did because there's so many things that we forget about or we don't take an advantage of that are there in front of us in our cabinet or easy to pick up in the store that can be a part of our health system. And really this goes towards a larger idea. And the larger idea, which again, you write about so eloquently inside the book, which is that it steps us into the love of food. There's so much fear around food. And listen, I'm going to be the first person to call myself out and even maybe past guests because we live in such a complicated world and nutrition science is very difficult to do. There sometimes are foods that people isolate or categories and there are maybe sometimes legitimate and maybe sometimes sensationalized concerns around those foods. You know, it could be gluten or it could be this thing or that. And yes, go back to the Goldilocks idea. Too much of something, you know, not enough of it, you know, the right fit in the middle. But really a lot of that has contributed to this fear of food. Right. And people constantly feel like they're going to make the wrong decision. Right. And this book is about stepping back into the love of food. And backing it up with some of the science. You know, you just mentioned something, which you were talking about foods that help you, uh, your your fat not get overactive. And one of the ones that you talked about was green tea. So what are one of the compounds or molecules that are part of green tea that make it become one of these foods? All right. Well, you know, who hasn't heard of the benefits of green tea, right? It's been sensationalized, right? And uh, to your point, I think that uh, in the modern world, uh, because of all this complexity, human nature tends to either create a hero or a demon. Uh, that's demonization or heroization, right? Green tea tends to be in the hero side. But for me, what I really try to bring to the forefront and into focus is that the science is actually trying to teach us exactly what it is that's in the tea. So we know tea has polyphenols, they're called catechins. We know one of the catechins is called EGCG. It's epigallocatechin 3 gallate. But don't worry about the fancy Latin scientific names. Let the scientists kind of deal with that. But there's a polyphenol in tea, catechin, that's actually really, really good for you. Not only does it cut off the blood supplies to help starve cancers, not only is it anti-inflammatory, uh, not only does it help protect your stem cells so you can regenerate from the inside out, the, the, the fiber in green tea and some of the catechins, catechin itself is actually a prebiotic, helps to nourish your, nourish your gut microbiome, take your gut bacteria, make it happy. It's antioxidant, good for your DNA, stimulate your immune system. So again, you know, these are the attributes of one of the only one of the substances that we know about in green tea that actually helps our body stay healthier. It turns out when it comes to your body fat, 
the catechin, the same substance, actually fights white fat. So it actually helps you um, actually lose some of the subcutaneous jiggly stuff. But more importantly, it actually helps you lose visceral fat, the harmful baseball glove fat that can be trapped even inside a skinny body. That's the stuff that chokes your organs, that grows fast. That's uh, the fat on the back of your tongue that we talked about earlier. Uh, so the bottom line is that um, green tea drinkers just metabolically are healthier. And here's the other thing about green tea. Not only does it have a catechin, but it's actually just brewed in water whether it's hot water or iced tea, iced green tea, you wind up hydrating yourself as well. And so again, you get multiple benefits and hydration also, by the way, a lot of people don't know this, but um, a cup of iced tea, a glass of iced tea has got water in it. Not only got the catechins, but it's got water in it. Turns out water itself turns on your metabolism, turns on your brown fat. And it's and basically when you drink iced tea cold or, or a glass of cup of cold water, it actually it gets into your stomach and there's a temperature gauge in your stomach that senses that's cold. And because it's your core body temperature, what we think happens is it triggers this, this gauge to turn on your metabolism to try to warm up the water. It's kind of like a, like a like a hot water thermos. It wants to warm it up and it turns up your metabolism to turn up your metabolism and activate your brown fat. Your brown fat needs that fuel to create the, to be the space heater. It draws down energy from your harmful fat, burns away some of your harmful fat. So again, you know, like th this is this is how this is a new way of thinking about our food. It's actually working our inner. The food is working our inner workings on our behalf of our metabolism, and by making really really smart choices, we can actually allow ourselves to unleash our inner metabolism. You broke out a whole section. And you talk about how insulin, blood insulin, is related to the conversation about metabolism and is connected to fat. Set that conversation up, and then there's a few things that I want to tease out inside of there. All right. So um, remember that analogy of pulling over to the gas station and filling up the tank. Uh, when your car, when your tank says, your gauge says low and your and car needs to be filled up so you can run your engine. Same thing in our body. When our uh, fuel tank runs low in our body, we pull over to the dinner table or to the pantry or the refrigerator or to the restaurant and we load to, to load up, right? Now, when we actually eat food to load up on our fuel, which are, has to be taken to our cells, what happens is that the moment food hits our body, we our pancreas secretes this hormone called insulin. Now, a lot of people have heard of insulin. Insulin is a pretty complicated uh, hormone, but when insulin goes up, it, it, it really partners up with the act of eating to draw that fuel and, and uh, to be able so our body can actually use it. It's that simple, all right, for most people to understand. Now, when our, when, when our body has insulin, which by the way, is also partnering with adiponectin, that fat-based hormone to allow this to be more efficient. So you want that body fat to actually be able to do, make insulin's job possible work in balance at the right amounts. Now, when insulin is up and you're absorbing energy, you're actually not able to burn. Your body's not able to burn fuel easily. It's kind of like when you're filling up your tank in a gas station, they tell you to turn off your engine so you're not burning the fuel as you're loading it in. So our body's actually uh, jury rigged so that we actually can't um, burn down fuel while we're loading up on fuel. It makes perfect sense. All right. Now, when we're not eating, between meals, but particularly when we're not eating for long periods of time, like when we're sleeping, which is called fasting, like between meals is fasting, relative fasting, then what happens is the insulin levels go down because you don't have food in your mouth. You're not eating. When the insulin levels go down, it takes a little while for the insulin levels to plateau down because you have to clean up all that energy that's in your blood. When insulin levels go down, then your metabolism switches into a different gear where it can actually burn down fuel again. Right, that's like basically stop loading uh, gas into your tank at a filling station, put the nozzle back, get in your car, start up that engine, and now you can begin burning fuel again. And so, when we're not eating, when insulin's low, we're able to burn fuel, burn fat, okay, excess fat, uh, excess fuel in our body fat. And when we're actually loading and eating, um, we're not able to do it. Our body's hardwired not to do it naturally, and that's why we need to be able to pay attention to how often we eat and when we eat and giving our body maximal time to be able to level off and burn off that extra fuel that we might've eaten during a day. One of my friends who's been on this podcast before, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, she also talks about how, especially as we get older, making sure we increase or maintain the muscle mass that we had when we were younger is an important part of that because muscle 
uses up a lot of the insulin in the body. How do you feel about that idea? Do you think that's very, very, true? very, very important? I mean, you know, like think think about it again. We're talking about remember that six thousand person study looking at the impact of body fat and metabolism. Well, the other component of that lifespan behavior is really what happens to your muscle. So when you're a little kid, you're skinny. You know, everyone, all, most kids are really skinny. They don't have a lot of muscle. But think about it: when you're adolescent, you know, and that's when both boys and girls wind up building their muscle. And, you know, boys in particular, you know, they start getting interested in building muscle. They can get ripped, right? So like basically everyone looks awesome if they're working out like when they're 18, 20, 21, when they're early 20s, you're never, you're never going to look like that again, right? <laughs> and that's and, and that base weight, not just because you're too busy to work out, but that actually has to do with sort of the biology. And so as we naturally get older, all those forces of behavior and lifestyle conspire in a little bit of our biology to start losing muscle mass. And so what's really important is that be able to to stay physically active, to keep on building muscle mass, to eat proteins so you are actually building up muscle mass. You never want to actually be protein deficit and under active. That's the setup actually to be able to lose that critical muscle mass. And by the way, when you lose muscle mass, I mean, you know, it could be whether you're you could be a big person and losing weight. You could be a thin person and 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 losing muscle mass. It's equally harmful. People actually have studied people with low muscle mass. You know, the extreme is called sarcopenia. I mean, that's basically what people look like when they've been stranded on a desert island or a concentration camp. That is a really, really unhealthy uh, place to be. It also wrecks your metabolism as well. So we, it's all part of that body Goldilocks zone. You're right. Fat needs to be tamed. Muscle needs to be groomed. Yeah. And even from what I understand, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, for a lot of the older population that's there, you know, you get into your later years, you can even be very fat and also be suffering from sarcopenia because you're over fat and under muscled, which makes you more likely to fracture your hip, which makes you more likely to be brittle and break your bones. Is that also the case? So it's not just somebody who looks very thin. It could be somebody thin, but it also could be somebody who's overweight, who has lost a lot of their muscle because they're not active and they're not eating protein. That is, that is absolutely correct. And then if you actually have too much, uh, too much body fat, so somebody who's obese with sarcopenia, uh, in, 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 insufficient muscle mass, if they fall and broke their hip, with that carrying that extra body excess body fat around, they're pro-inflammatory, their health defense systems are down, they're going to heal a lot slower as well. And so again, this is why we see in a lot of elderly people, um, when they actually break their hip, if you know they they oftentimes that's at this the spiral towards the end for them because their bodies are naturally compromised. Not only do they not have enough muscle mass, they have excess uh, fat body fat as well. And and that actually counters their ability to heal and rebound back to a state of health. And so to stay healthy, we need to tame our fat and we need to nourish and nurture our muscles. You know, you're mostly known for like highlighting some of the benefits that crazy, amazing benefits. Nobody does this better than you, right? And it's, I'm not just saying that because you're my friend, like you do such an incredible job of being the hype man for all the incredible compounds that are found in, especially like a lot of plant foods. Uh, this book, you actually have a whole section on seafood, which we're going to chat about coming up next. Um, and you know, you do that really well for fruits, vegetables, mushrooms, things like that. And this is a question for me. You know, we just talked about protein. Not that you can't get protein from plant compounds too. Of course you can. How do you feel about the prioritization of um, animal proteins inside of the diet? And then seafood can be a, a classification of that as well too. So just would love you to take that, you know, take that on. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I, I sort of... Um reflect back on my own lifestyle and also how I try to counsel people like patients who ask me, uh, how should I be, what should I not be eating and should I be going vegetarian or vegan? And I really try to make that an individual conversation. I think that's super important. Um, everyone is different. Everyone comes from someplace. And this is something I write about a lot in my book, which is, you know, we all have points of origin in our relationship with food. We all come from some culture, family culture, uh, ethnic culture, religious cultures where, you know, it's very natural for us to actually be living in a certain way. I think that the, uh, you know, many times in modern society, we leap for these kind of extreme diets or extreme philosophies. Um, and I have no problem with, you know, the ethical nature of veganism. 
that's an ethical decision. That that happens to be also a generally healthy decision. But that's not you don't become a vegan because you're healthy. You want to be healthy. It's like it's really the origin of it is really a religious. I mean, a moral, uh, an ethical decision, a moral decision. And I'm all for that if that's what what's important to you. Some people actually, you know, really like to eat um, animal protein. And what I would counsel them is that if you eat animal protein, make good choices and make the right choices, not only for yourself, but also be conscious that there's a planetary implication for um, the protein, animal protein you actually choose. And so this is where I think modern, uh, sort of the modern zeitgeist is really useful. If you eat red meat, just realize that, look, red meat is generally not that healthy for you. So if you eat it, eat it in moderation. If you're going to choose to eat red meat, realize that just the, the farming of animals, the way that we tend to eat it now um, uh, from factory farming, not done in a way that's actually particularly healthy or sustainable for the planet. Um, so if you're going to do it, just recognize what you're actually doing. You're you're making a move that that if you if you overdo it, it's, it's not going to be good for you or for the planet. But I don't want to actually stop you. I don't want to become the policeman against animal protein. Just recognize what you're actually doing, right? I mean, I think that that's it's kind of like speeding on the highway. You know, you need to get someplace. All right, you're gonna go over 65 or whatever. Don't do it for a long time. It's not that good for you, and you might kill somebody uh, if you get into an accident. So I think that like my my approach is sort of like respect the people who want to um, uh, eat it in a in a pattern that's healthy. People that are not eating in that traditionally healthy pattern, just try to provide the framework so they can actually make better decisions. Seafood, you know, is another source of really useful protein. Um, uh, and, and actually, remarkably. All the epidemiological studies have shown that people who eat two to three servings of fish uh, a day for seafood naturally, um, they tend to actually live longer. They have longer, healthier lives as part of an overall balance, not not to at, not at the exclusion of plant based foods. All right, but there is no study that shows that people who eat red meat predominantly live longer than everyone else. That's that that's the one thing. So again, you know. Uh, buyer beware, you know, you're making these choices. Yeah, you know that uh, certain patterns are good. And for seafood, by the way, not all seafood is created equal. If you eat mercury laden, large predatory fish at the top of the food chain, that's going to damage the heavy metals are going to damage you as well. And so you want to be and, and by the way, overfishing, not good for the planet either. So I think that this idea uh, of of eating mindfully more so than eating sort of according to a specific rigid practice is more useful. And what I write about my book is uh, really try to attach people, connect people to how I approach food. I grew up in a a place in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where we had a lot of ethnicities. Um, I had wonderful folk festivals where everyone celebrated their traditional food cultures. That's what I grew up in. I grew up with an Asian background, Chinese background. My mom cooked fresh food, um, mostly plant-based, uh, every single day. It tasted great. Um, I, I, I did a gap year. I lived in Italy and I lived in Greece. I lived in the Mediterranean uh, long before people were talking about Mediterranean uh, cuisine. And I, I, I saw how much joy it actually gave people. So for me, naturally, I go out my life navigating uh, t- uh, around, should I eat something tonight? What am I going to eat today? Well, what genre should I choose? It's going to be probably in a med- Mediterranean or an Asian genre. That's where I naturally go. Not exclusively, but I, I that's where I, that's where my natural water line is. And once I choose in those directions, I try to look at, I try to respect, I immediately sense the value of these traditional recipes and cuisines. And I do take a look at like, well, what are the ingredients that are in them and how are they prepared? And is it prepared? And do I think there's ultra processed stuff in it? I try to veer away from that. If it's more natural, local, sustainable, plant-based, I will go for that. But the bottom line is it tastes great. I lean into my food. I get joy from eating. I don't like to pig out. Okay. It makes me, I'm, I'm like anyone else. If you eat too much, you feel gross. You feel, uh, you, if you gorge, you're not going to feel good. But you can actually sample from what I call the Mediterranean way of eating. It's a way of eating. It's not a diet. And really get a great joy out of life. And that to me is something I really want my book to communicate. You can you can love your food and love your health. Yeah. I think it's an important message. You know, a couple of things I want to tease out on, on what you've shared. You know, I grew up vegetarian. And then for a while, I became vegan 
primarily out of like ethical, moral decisions. Okay. And also I had a very uh, transformative experience, which is that I had really bad acne in high school all the way since my freshman year. It's like the gods are looking down at me from my freshman year right to my senior year. And then my summer of my senior year before I went into college, I went to a youth uh, camp mm -hmm. uh, that was done for people that were from this background of India, the Jain community, J-A-I-N. Mm -hmm. And the keynote speaker there was somebody who was trying to get everybody excited about getting off a of dairy, which was a very tough thing to do because these kids are already all vegetarian, right? And now you're going to tell them that dairy is not something that they can have. And most of the kids are checked out. They're like, look, the only place that I literally can eat is Taco Bell when I go out. You're going to tell me that I have to like not get cheese anymore. So mostly everybody was checked out. And at the end of the talk, she said, well, I also want you to know that dairy, this is in the year 2000. So mm -hmm. this, is, this is a while ago, right? And um, I was just turning 18 at the time. She said, dairy can be uh, first time I'd heard somebody say like, I don't know if she used the word inflammatory, inflammation, dairy can sometimes cause some inflammation for the gut and then you can get acne. And as soon as I heard acne, as somebody had been struggling for years, Your I said, okay, uh, my radar's up. I've tried the different gels. I've tried the different prescriptions. They dried out my skin, but ultimately the acne persisted. So I went on a journey and I took off dairy hmm. and within a month, a month and a half, my skin completely cleared up. Wow. Now, the type of dairy that I was having at the time was just commercial factory farm milk. Nobody taught me. I didn't learn until much later on about all the nuances that actually, you know, there's goat's milk and there's yogurt and there's this small batch dairy that can be made more ethically. And actually dairy isn't inflammatory unless if you have a GI issue based on all the big studies that are out there. So, you know, that was my own journey, right? I went through an experience. I kind of bought hook, line, and sinker, the the plant-based message. And as I started to get more into the world of personalized nutrition, personalized well medicine through the people that I met, I started to understand that you can piece together different things to still be healthy. And you always have all the diversity of plant foods that are out there. And I also realized I was probably under eating on protein. And so I got that back up as well. And when people just told me like, how do you eat? I would just say, you know, I eat my own personal way, but I just try to make it clean. I'm off of ultra processed foods, right? I was plant. I don't even say I'm plant-based now because the only thing is, is that even though I eat a ton of plant food, I don't want to give the misconception that it's easy for everybody to hit their protein goals without having animal protein. When I started tracking my protein, you really have to work hard if you're vegan and you're vegetarian, if you want to hit those protein goals for what's needed uh, you know, to be age appropriate and avoid sarcopenia and things like that. But I do respect completely the message that regardless of how you eat, there's some core principles that you wanna make sure you never let go of. And that's really what this book is about, right? Don't let go of the diversity of foods, don't let go of the range and sample from all these different traditions that are there and then find that last 10% that people wanna tweak, great, let them tweak and people can debate about it all day, but there's plenty of sick people out there. So let's just get them at least on the fundamentals that we know work. Absolutely. And I think you know the other part of it to, to, to just co connect to where you, the story you just told me is that, think about it. So many of us are influenced uh, in our connections to food and our, our dialogue that we have with food and connecting to health start when we're younger. Right. I mean, like, you know, whether, whether it's a teenage high school years or, or in college, like people start to become more conscious. There is a consciousness of how food connects to our health that starts quite early. It's not something that you just like suddenly the lights go on when you're 30 or whatever, uh, or older. And so I think that the, uh, importance is to realize that our relationship with food, our consciousness of food begins long before we actually are, uh, are maybe um, explicitly aware of it. And the more mindful we are, you know, one of the things that I talk about uh, in, in the uh, last part of my book for, you know, how do you actually put this uh, plan into action so yeah, you can improve principles. your metabolism? I, you know, I, I recommend food journaling. You know, you, you bust out uh, uh, either a piece of paper and a pen if you're old school or uh, you could uh, just use like I, I've done, just take, take my phone, my iPhone, open up the notes and I just record um, what I'm, what time I eat and what I'm actually eating and how much I actually eat. No biggie. You just it's a, scroll a couple of notes. And when you do that over the course of a day, over the course of a couple of days, over that course of a week, and you look back at it, it, it really does give you a um, an objective view of what your relationship with food actually is like. 
we're 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 interacting with our foods all the time and i think as an adult we we tend to lose connection we tend to lose that concrete connection of like what are the things that motivate us towards eating when we're kids and maybe whatever our mom served us you know or whenever we're sneaking out with our friends you know you talk about the taco bell but but honestly you know i think that now we're adults we can actually be more mindful of these choices and i kind of feel that we should really also be in touch with who we are that personalization you said is so important we each individually have our own preferences I read about this in my first book as well. I call it food preferences. Don't feel like if somebody tells you to eat, um, you know, walnuts, that that's all you have to eat. It's not going <laughs> to solve all your problems. You know what? If you love walnuts, it's fine. But if you prefer a different nut or a different, you know, um, look for that. Look for the thing that works for you. In every single one of my books, including this one, I put hundreds of foods down that are all supported by evidence. And, I, and I, what I encourage people to do is, bust out your Sharpie or whatever it is that you actually do or highlighter, circle the ones, the foods that you love already, because those are the ones that are going to work for you. That's telling. That's kind of a, a kind of um, self-reflection of what healthy foods do you already love? Start with those and you're already ahead of the game. You know, the f I did a test uh, after I'd been vegan for about like six, seven years. And again, I'm not putting that down and I respect everybody's choices. I have plenty of friends that are vegan, everything, eat any way they want to eat. But I'm just talking about my own personal journey, right? And I so appreciate the fact that in this book, there's a lot more of your personal journey, which is part of the reason that I'm setting up this question. One of the first tests that I did, I have no affiliation with them, but it was a test that was recommended to me uh, by a friend and it was called Omega Quant. And it was looking about my Omega-3 to Omega-6 ratio, which there are so many studies around. And I saw that one of the reasons that maybe I was having depressive-like symptoms, I was not diagnosed with depression, is that I was so low on my omega-3 and my omega-6s were up really high. It's a great test. Anybody can do it from home. It's like 90 bucks or whatever, and you, you, know, you can get it done. Little prick of the blood. And it's that time that one of the first foods, as I started you know, Googling and looking around, and I started seeing all these seafoods that were out there. And seafoods was a foreign concept to me. I had never really grown eating fish growing up. And, you know, I think that there are a lot of people that if you look at society now, we're not really consuming a lot of seafood. Now, pro there's a lot of, you know, fair criticisms around seafood. You've touched on a lot of them before, microplastics, mercury, other things. But generally speaking, if people are going to include more seafood in their diet that they're also going to get a chance to make, it's going to crowd out a lot of the other unhealthier processed food calories that are there. So in you writing about seafood, what were some of the ones that were out there that really stood out to you as sort of these um, ancient nutritional foods that are not just going to become a healthy part of a diet, but have these super healing properties in the context of metabolism? Listen, uh, because I like to cook and I really um, find joy in food traditions, that question is like a perfect setup for me to, to talk about sort of my own my own story. Um, you know, I grew up in Pennsylvania, inland. Uh, I didn't grow up e eating, I mean, I didn't grow up naturally on the coast eating a lot of seafood. But um, I learned to love seafood by, um, by, by having the opportunity to taste seafood that was cooked really, really well. Mm. I think that's one of the biggest um, uh, uh, kind of like uh, blockades to people kind of trying seafood. If all you've had is, you know, uh, salmon from, you know, like your cafeteria, school cafeteria, uh, or, you know, you associate tuna fish salads, uh, sandwiches with cat food, you know, it smells like cat food, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of not palatable, right? But the thing is that if you go to look at any of these cultures where seafood is very natural, and again, I've had the privilege as part of my research to travel around the world. I've got friends in different places, Hong Kong, Barcelona, Venice, Italy. You know, when they invite me in, they, they tour me around the markets. You know, like you see those TV travel shows where people are being like that. That's me. Uh, I'm being led around by locals and they're showing me their, their delicacies, right? So you go to the Venetian fish market, which is unbelievable. Uh, and you have a local showing you the cuttlefish or you're showing you the squid or showing you the tiny little crabs like that you would never see normally. And then you sit down, you eat it, and it's prepared in this traditional way that's unbelievably delicious, like flavors you've never had before. That's the kind of adventuresome, adventurous kind of like... Um, uh, nature that I tell people for uh, that they should really approach seafood. Um, 
wander out. I mean, a good way to do is actually go to a restaurant that's cooking seafood, good seafood, and and try something in a way that you haven't had before. So let's back up for a second. So uh, most people know about salmon. All right. Salmon is good for you. Um, but, you know, even for me, I, I can only have so much salmon. So it's the same damn salmon that like it, I could never have a staple of salmon. I, I'm craving diversity, something different, right? Um, then you say, well, if you're talking about health, it's got to be oily fish. Salmon's got a lot of omega-3s. What are some of the oily fish? So then you kind of automatically go to mackerel, sardines, anchovies. And some people go, well, you know, those are pretty strong tasting fish. You know, I don't know if I like want to eat those. And so immediately then you kind of just discard seafood as a whole category. Not for me, right? It's fishy. I don't want to be eating that. Well, that's where I'm actually telling you that if you go to these cultures that actually go to the Mediterranean coastline or look at the coastal culture uh, around Mediterranean or Asia, you'll see all these amazing ways of cooking. So how do I tell people to do this? Um, pick a seafood that you might see in the market that is interesting to you. And I'll give you a little clue on how to do that. And we'll talk about some of the interesting seafood I write about. But if you don't know what to do with it, by the way, this is the beautiful thing about the internet. All right. Type that seafood's name out with Mediterranean or Asia with recipe and then click video and up will pop YouTube videos of people who are more than happy to show you the joy of cooking it. How do you select it? How do you clean it? How do you prep it? How do you cook it step by step and then talk to you about how delicious it actually tastes? There's no excuse. There's no barriers to actually finding a way to actually get a delicious way to cook seafood now. Um, uh, so what are some of the interesting seafood I wrote about? Well, I wrote about salmon, of course. Then what I found, wrote about is this remarkable study that showed that salmon improves your metabolism because it's very rich in omega-3s. Of course, we would know that. Omega-3s fight white, white harmful body fat, including visceral fat. It activates your brown fat. Your, it, it turns on your metabolism, uh, uh, lowers your, lo, uh, evens out, lowers your lipids, your harmful cholesterol. All good, right? Salmon. We knew that. All right. Good for cardiovascular, lower coloring vascular disease. But another study that was done in uh, Finland uh, uh, and, and Ireland actually showed that when you compare salmon to cod, not an oily fish, that just that the amount of omega-3s in cod, which is 5.5 times lower than in salmon, right? So oily fish, it's got to be oily, right? Nope, even five times lower than salmon, you still get the omega-3 benefits. So this tells you about the dose response. You can actually go way lower than the amount of omega-3s in salmon to get a meta metabolic uh, benefit. Weight loss, shrinking waist circumference, lipids lowering. This to me was like a groundbreaking discovery that you can actually eat much lower levels of omega-3 and still get the, the metabolic benefits. All right. Now, what I've done in the book, and I've, I've, and again, I've done all the heavy lifting, all the math for people. I've converted the amount of omega threes that you find in in cod, all right, and I've converted it across all kinds of seafood that you would find in the grocery store. If you walk by the seafood section, so you got the mussels, you got the clams, you got the king crab, you've got the lobsters, you've got the, and those are the, the shellfish, maybe some squid, but also, you know, the, the hake, uh, the, the, um, uh, the bass, the sea bass, I converted it all. All right. So, and I, and by converting it, I can tell you exactly how much you need to eat, how many pieces you need to eat in order to actually get the same benefit as the omega-3 you get in, um, uh, in, uh, in, in cod, all right, which works. Now, obviously, if you get a, if you get an oily fish like mackerel, I can tell you uh, it's it's very little that you actually need to eat. So that's the other thing about dose. So to get the same amount of metabolically active weight fi body fat fighting weight loss uh, for cod, all you need to eat is one forkful of mackerel. Gives you enough omega three. It's packed with omega threes. But you could also have four medium sized shrimp. Right. So this is liberating. This means that if you're inclined to explore the diversity of food and look at protein, uh, sources of protein, including healthy proteins like in seafood, and you're looking at whether you're going around your grocery store, you know, like seafood section is a place that a lot of people just ignore because they push their cart right by it. <laughs> I'm telling you, read my book, take a look at it, look at some recipes, and then take the time to actually um, uh, get interested in what they're actually offering. If you happen to be living in a place, like Los Angeles or Tokyo or Maine or any coastal city, San Francisco, Boston, 
take the time to go to a seafood section and, and, and a, a seafood monger and see where all the different kinds of things they can sell. It is true. It, you know, when you buy seafood, you want to cook it that day. So it requires a little bit extra effort, but man, it tastes so great that once you kind of get over that hump of preparation and you feel confident in making it, it's really worth it. Mm, that's well said. And there's plenty of services that will ship to you frozen. Right. And that's still great too, because often that can be just as fresh, if not fresher, because they're freezing it at the factory. Again, as long as you get from a good place and location and everything. And, and I'm not pushing uh, this brand, but I can tell you, I just did a... Uh, I just did a video interview with uh, the founder of a uh, sustainable seafood group. It's called Sea to Table. And, uh, and and again, I, I don't receive any money from them. But the thing that's amazing that, that they were telling me is that not only do they try, they have traceable seafood, they specifically look for sustainable fishing practices. It's all frozen, but it's frozen on the boat. So, the, so mm. it, it locks in all the omega-3s and all the proteins fresh right then and there, and then they ship them very nicely to your home. So in fact, it's even fresher than the fish that has to go back to shore before it's packed on ice and flown around an airplane someplace. And, and it, like, it really changed, changed my mind about the idea of frozen seafood. So if you're in the middle of the country, uh, uh, last summer I was on an RV, I took up an RV trip just to see the United States. And I went right into the middle of the country. You know, I was like in Nebraska and South Dakota, you know, as far away from the ocean you could make it. I went to, you know, the basic grocery stores and I wanted to take a look at like, how do I find healthy food in the middle of the country? All right. You know, like, of course, there's produce there. But I went to the frozen section and I opened up the freezer section and I found there was a bounty of seafood flash frozen at sea that you can actually buy. So you can get healthy seafood even if you may live far away from the ocean. Yeah, and I think that's such an important thing because there's, again, so much well-intentioned food phobia, and some of that is associated with topics that are just very controversial, and there's a lot of nuances in there, like seafood and overfishing, and at the same time, too, the part that I feel like it's a little bit politically incorrect, but it's the truth, You, every category you go to, you're going to find somebody who's going to demonize that thing. And if you let those information sources, even in the wellness community, run wild, then you're going to let be left with nothing that you can get a chance to eat. And confusion. You'll and be confusion. And the thing is that I feel like seafood, especially because the research is one of those areas, but I actually feel it's going to be coming to the other protein categories too, because we're learning so much more about what actually drives atherosclerosis. And there's great cardiologists that are out there. There's one that's coming on here that's going to go through my blood panel, you know, that's going to go through all the latest uh, scans that are out there that are way better than CT scans. There's a scan, again, no affiliation with them. It's called a clearly scan that looks at soft plaque buildup, mm. right? CT scans, which look for hard plaque buildup. And the whole idea is that, okay, great. We don't want to have so much high concentration of saturated fat in our diet or a high level of ApoB. Why? Because then that's going to lead to, you know, potentially uh, plaque buildup and also associated with inflammation. Well, that's a much more detailed story than what people are talking about. Right. And so there's a lot of nuances and it's very specific to each person and we're getting better and better testing. So he's going to walk my audience through my clearly scan. How much soft plaque buildup do I have? Where is my LDL number, which has always been high, even though I eat a diet that's very healthy and things like that. I've always had high LDL. And so where is it a problem? Where is it not a problem? And how can people start to think a little bit more nuanced for these categories that become so polarizing and demonizing that we may not have the full story out yet on these topics? Well, I mean, I think that you make such a good point, which is that in the wellness community, and you know maybe this is just part of the the nature of the of our community you've got uh, authoritative voices that are um passionate i think good intention but by practice they wind up either creating heroes or demons by the way it's it's always easier to get attention when you demonize something all right and and but and then if you make a hero you want to sort of like sell it as the hero but the reality is that and what i try to bring it back in my book is really that uh, old traditions that have been time tested, and I'm not talking about like 50 years, I'm talking about like 5,000 years, you know, go way, way, way back. These traditions, uh, particularly food traditions, uh, really align uh, healthy food practices, 
you know, with sustainable food, uh, with sustainable ingredients prepared in ways that tend to be healthier and, uh, and, and give you that diversity, uh, as well as the pleasure uh, of food. And so I talk about, you know, back to Mediterranean, cause that's how, how I eat and, and people are like, oh, well, where did you come up with that? And, and I explain it, you know, by, by my own history and my own background. But in fact, I always explain that it matches really well with ancient traditions. So Mediter- Mediterranean and Asian, two of the healthiest uh, traditional food cultures in the world, also tastiest cultures by my by my reckoning, by my palate, um, and I think most people would agree with me, uh, uh, actually date back two or 3,000 years. And in fact, they were once connected by uh, the Silk Road, which is the uh, most famous, most influential trading route in human history. So going back 2,000 years, you actually had um, China and the Mediterranean, Asia and the Mediterranean, connected by this road that wound through central uh, Eurasia, went through, wound through India, and all the way went all the way to Turkey and then into the Mediterranean. And the traders back then met each other, exchange ingredients, exchange foods, exchange recipes. And so it's, to some extent, this is the opportunity for us to rediscover some of those old exchanges that were always there. This isn't necessarily about fusion food where you have to go to some, you know, uh, uh, iron chef <laughs> to come up with something really cool. That's cool too. Listen, I, I, I love creativity and I think creativity with food is really awesome. I have a lot of friends who are chefs, but I think that, you know, by rediscovering our roots of, of tasty food and being mindful about how to choose, look, they didn't survive tradition for thousands of years if they were going to be really unhealthy practices. And if you think about that, it makes you wonder whether or not eating all these ultra processed foods are going to survive another thousand years. Probably not, right? Like It's only the good things that are actually going to survive over time, the test of, standard test of time. So I think going back and recognizing there's a history to Mediterranean eating that's based on traditional combinations, know-how, uh, uh, revered tastes and preparations. And it's something that, you know, we didn't have the same kind of frenetic society, wellness community. I think back then, wellness was just much more natural to who we were. It's part of, we didn't have all this, we didn't have all the distractions that we have today. I'm encouraging people to say, we have science that really pushes us to understand why these practices actually are good. We can use our individual tastes and preferences to rediscover which of those foods and ingredients actually fit our own bodies, our own preferences, our own psyches the best, and really lean into them. So this idea of getting away from food fear, fat fear, you know, like to really try to get back into balance, that's really what my new book is all about. What do you think is important to think about, especially under the context of longevity, which everybody's talking about right now, and your take on DNA protection and food and lifestyle. Yeah, well, so look, I, I have, you know, my background is that I'm an internal medicine doctor and I'm also a research scientist. And my background for many years was in primarily in biotechnology where, you know, we were developing really fancy, very sophisticated treatments for cancer and diabetes and vision loss. And, and I'm still involved with that, very much involved with it. But one of the areas that I was, I thought was super cool that I was involved with was gene therapy. So this is where you take a piece of DNA and you can actually stitch it to a cold virus and you inject it um, into um, a heart or you can inject it into a leg with the goal of that piece of DNA telling the body to uh, grow more blood vessels, to grow better circulation. So, you know, it's a piece of the genetic code. And I have, you know, literally like well over a decade of experience of doing gene therapy not ready for prime time yet. Okay. Um, there is one gene therapy that's actually, um, uh, FDA approved, but it's, and it's for a rare congenital form of blindness, but all the other stuff is still very much in the workshop kind of being figured out. So we, and and of course, then you have your, you know, the 23s and me's and ancestry.com's where you actually can, you know, swab yourself and send it and see how much, how much of you is Cro-Magnon or, you know, where your ancestors actually came from. Right. And the answers are always really surprising when you take a look at the code, what parts of you belong to, which um, uh, came from what parts of the world. That's how most people think about DNA, right? The, our genetic code, or maybe Jurassic Park, you know, you think about T-Rex or the, the Velociraptor. But let me tell you, um, all, you know, so DNA, uh, every one of our human cells, we've got 40 trillion cells in our human body. They're really small. You can't see them with a the naked eye. You need to see them under the microscope. What most people don't realize is that DNA 
is if you were to if you were to have a really really fine needle and go under the microscope and open up a cell human cell and pull out all the dna there'd be a six foot strand of dna that you could pull out all right that's two yards worth of dna okay like how on earth could that fit into the cell and it's it's all made of dna which is our genetic code but do you know that only three percent of that six foot in length is actually used for making proteins, which is what our genetic code normally does. So most of the other part of our DNA is air traffic control and protection. So DNA is hardwired to protect us from the environment. And I think this is what's really, and this is how it relates to, to aging, all right? So when we're born, uh, when we're forming in our mom's womb, everything, you know, we hope is picture perfect. When we come out, immediately we start aging. So people say, well, you know, like I'm 60 or I'm 70 and I'm aging. Hey man, you're aging like when you're one minute old. The clock is ticking the moment you like take your first, you, when you get spanked, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're starting to age. You take your first breath. All right. So what happens is that our cells all are in this program. Um, and that program actually will um, think about the Mission Impossible fuse. Light the fuse, it burns down. Okay. When you burn that fuse all the way down to the bottom, like pretty much you've expended the life of the cell and the cell needs to actually replace itself. And over our time, 60, 70, 80, 90 years, okay, um, we pretty much run out of, of, of our materials to actually keep renewing ourselves. And we st our, and as our cells age, net net, we also age as well. That's why, you know, a kid looks at themselves in a mirror and basically just sees the same image, same youthful chubby image, you know, like, you know, with the cheeks and everything else. When you're when you're like in your teenage and your adolescence and you know in your 20s you're cut and buff you want to look as well as you can as good as you can as you get older you start noticing those lines and wrinkles and the gray hairs and the things that are like hey a minute that that's not me well actually what what you're seeing in the mirror is the reflection of your cells wearing down now there's a lot of work about longevity of like how do we slow down the aging process some people want to reverse the aging process what I will tell you is that one of the trick triggers is our DNA um, needs to be able to protect itself better against the environment because our environment ages us. So what am I talking about? We all know somebody who spent, you know, their uh, their uh, adolescence and young adult life lying out uh, in on the beach, and then when they're in their forties, man, they are they're they're like leather, right? And they they look like their skin's pretty rough. That's aged skin sun aging of skin. Okay. Now that's what we see in the extreme, but I can tell you the same thing is happening when you're stuck in traffic in Los Angeles on the I-10 and on a sunny day and the sun is coming in on a windshield or your, or your arms out the window, you're still getting that damage. So how come we don't turn into leather every single time we get stuck in traffic or walk or go out for a run? It's because our DNA knows how to fix itself and reverse that damage that's occurring. We got our DNA actually, um, uh, experiences a problem about 10,000 times a day. And if we didn't fix ourselves, we'd be aging a lot faster uh, uh, than, than we already do. And so one of the tricks to slowing down aging is to help our support our DNA's ability to fix itself from the environment. And so this is the ability for DNA to, to block the incoming missiles from the environment, uh, ultraviolet radiation from the sky, radon from the ground, off-gassing from your carpet, from your, you know, that new car smell, all fumes coming in, smelling that gasoline at the pump, which is now rising in cost, right? Because everything's going on in the world. All that stuff actually damages our DNA. Thank goodness our health defenses, our DNA is one of our health defenses, can fix itself to prevent that problem. Now, uh, if, there's, if there's damage in the DNA, a pothole, so one is to prevent the potholes. If there's a damage, if there's a pothole, the DNA can actually fill it as quickly as the damage occurred. And that's where foods can also be coming in helpful to help our um, DNA fix itself. Uh, there was a study that she looked at kiwi, the fruit we just talked about. And they wanted to know, like, if you had just one kiwi a day, would it help? How much would it help protect your DNA against incoming? And they actually found that one kiwi a day, say, give somebody a kiwi to eat a day, take their blood out, expose it to environmental damage like ultraviolet radiation or some other kind of toxic, noxious exposure. And one kiwi a day will protect your cells with the DNA by 60%. So it's like putting up a 60% shield, one kiwi, all right? Um, 
Vitamin C, other bioactives in the kiwi all help our DNA to do that. Now, if you ate three kiwis though, now not only are you shielding yourself against that damage, now the DNA note is, is, is uh, inspired, geared, triggered to fix itself. You can fix holes 60% faster. So one, you can actually raise a shield. The second, you can actually put the construction crew to start to pave the road, repave those potholes as well. And there's a third thing that's really important for um, aging to prevent cellular aging, right? So you want to prevent the damage, you want to fix the damage, and now you want to slow that fuse down. So that, that Mission Impossible fuse, when the mission is over, man, that cell's done. It's old and it needs to be replaced. So to, you can actually slow down the burning of that fuse, which is really amazing. So that's slowing cellular aging. And if you multiply that by 40 trillion, now you're slowing your entire body's aging. And foods can actually do that too. One of my favorites is actually what I got right here. Coffee will actually help you do that. It'll slow down the burn rate of your DNA. Well, on that note of coffee, and by the way, it's fantastic information. Um, do you have uh, any rules in your life to get the maximum benefits from coffee, but then also to mitigate any kind of downside that could be associated with having maybe either too much or having coffee at, let's say, not the right hour of the day? Just curious for yourself personally. Again, there's so many benefits to coffee. I drink coffee as well. Anything that you do yourself to to make sure that you're in that Goldilocks zone of getting the maximum benefits from coffee. Great question. And, and again, obviously I'm not giving medical advice here, but you know, when you ask me, what does Dr. Lee do? I mean, I'm happy to tell you, number one, I, I, would, I, I really only learned to, I mean, I drank coffee when I was in college, uh, probably not very good coffee. But then when I um, lived in Italy for a short time on a gap year after college, I really learned what coffee uh, was all about and good coffee and how the different ways of brewing it uh, and and how to how to drink it and when to drink it and I also learned um, uh, something about um, uh, the role that coffee can play in, in enhancing your life. So most of and of course when I was in medical school I drank a ton of coffee. But so most of us think of coffee as sort of a morning brew, right? Uh, either you make it yourself uh, in a pot or you go by the drive through to pick up something and you get a little hit of caffeine that wakes you up all true. OK. Um, and for me, uh, I appreciate that. But I, I learned to appreciate the taste of coffee, which is actually quite sophisticated. And as I sort of was learning more and more about my research through my research on what's in coffee that's good for you, you know, the caffeine that's that that can give you a little hit a little a little surge um, and that would be the reason why I wouldn't drink coffee late at night because that could disturb my ability to get good quality REM sleep when you disturb your sleep your immune system suffers you know your even your gut microbiome actually suffers if you don't get good sleep your body during good quality sleep your body renews itself regenerates itself and so if you drink a ton of coffee late night you know, and you don't have to pull an all-nighter, pretty much you're disrupting your sleep and therefore disrupting the, reju the rejuvenation, the renewal, the rebooting of your body's health defenses. So I, I don't drink coffee really, really late. Now, um, uh, but, but yeah, actually caffeine is only part of the story. It turns out that there's other amazing bioactive natural chemicals found in coffee. One of them is called chlorogenic acid. Chlorogenic acid actually is made by the coffee plant, OK, um, uh, so coffee bean is, comes, is a plant based food. Um, uh, it grows on a tree, coffee tree. Uh, and uh, Mother Nature made chlorogenic acid as part of the coffee pl uh, tr uh, trees, coffee plants, self-defense system. So when um, uh, bugs and pests nibble on the coffee leaves and stems, the, the plant views that as an assault, as an attack. And the little nibbles actually are wounds. So the coffee tree is getting wounded and it makes more chlorogenic acid to drive away the pests. It's kind of a natural pesticide and it's a wound healing response. All right. So um, uh, that chlorogenic acid is therefore more present in organically grown coffee. OK, now that what does chlorogenic acid do in your body? Well, chlorogenic acid activates your health defenses, lights up your immune system, lowers inflammation, cuts off the blood supply to cancer, helps to um, pull out and protect stem cells, and is also good for your gut health. So all of a sudden you got another grand slammer, right? 
coffee. But now we know that when you compare organically grown coffee with conventionally grown coffee with pesticides, the organic has like three times more chlorogenic acid for that pest nibbling property that I talked about. If you use pesticides, hey, it doesn't need to make as much because, you know, some factory chemical that you did the job for it. And so here's an example now where I'm where I learned that if I'm actually able to drink coffee that I grind myself from the bean and I and I choose an organic coffee, which uh, I, I happen to do more and more now because of this new research, I know I'm going to get more chlorogenic acid, uh, which is actually better for my health. And you're going to avoid the pesticides, some of which we know a lot of information on, some of which we don't know as much of information on, but they are possible things that contribute to those potholes that would damage our DNA that we're trying to avoid. Which then could contribute to cancer. And, you know, so, you know, like, again, one of these things that we really want to do is just, I think, make mindful decisions when we are putting things into our body. You know, like when you get a baby, you know, like you're teaching the kid what not to put in their mouth. You know, food, a spoonful of food, absolutely put it in your mouth. You know, a Lego block, don't put that in your mouth. You know, electrical plug, don't put it in your mouth. And I think that, you know, as we get older, we, we sort of, one of the big problems is like when we just are uh, are distracted and start shoveling food in our bodies. And, and I think that's where the new research is starting to help to bring us back to our past where people just became much more mindful of what they're putting into their body and, and giving some thought to, is this something that could be helpful or something that could be harmful? When you and I were chatting a few days ago and we were talking about, you know, some of the things that we want to talk about in today's interview, you were suggesting that one of the things that's worthwhile talking about is this idea of food and medicine, not just food is medicine. And what does it look like when food and medicine can get a chance to work together? And you are beautifully sitting at the intersection as somebody who's inv been involved with dozens of drugs that are FDA approved and also has this deep knowledge in the space of food is medicine. So I'd love you to talk about that a little bit. And I heard you on uh, my business partners podcast, just a little bit of a preview for those folks uh, in that, that listen to Dr. Hyman's podcast as well. And you were talking about, uh, you started this conversation by starting the stage and chatting about why first do no harm may not be the complete picture uh, when it comes to the oath that doctors are taking and working with their patients. So I don't know if that's a good place to start or if you want to start somewhere else, but I'll hand it over to you. No, that's a great place to start. So, you know, when I went to med school, right? So when you start your first day in med school, you get your white coat and your stethoscope and and then you spend all this all these years buried in books and 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 learning the the ropes. And the reward at the very end of that is you get a medical degree, but the but the the real kind of pinnacle I think for for anybody who goes through medical school and the moment before you become a doctor, you got to recite the Hippocratic oath. And among the many things in the Hippocratic oath is this pledge that we will first do no harm, right? And uh, to our patients, we wanna do everything good for the patient, but we don't wanna do anything harmful. Well, that's actually been used essentially like a sledgehammer phrase. I mean, it's almost like a meme in medicine that basically says, well, that's an excuse for not to do the right thing. You know, I have a new treatment and it could actually, you know, really make a difference in your disease. Shall we try it? And, and like, you know, like if you talk to a bunch of doctors, the more conservative one will say, you know, I don't know that, I don't know what, I'm not familiar with that medicine, so I'm not going to try it. So first first adage is the first do no harm. I'm not going to, I'd rather not give it. And I'm somebody who has worked at the forefront, the bleeding edge of medicine where, you know, I know we can do better for cancer. I know we can do better for Alzheimer's disease. I know we can do better for diabetes. And so I'm never afraid to use the power of science to be able to even eke out incremental improvements to help you know, my patients. I want them to benefit from every last bit um, that, of knowledge that, that we can actually use. So for me, I actually no longer say first do no harm. I actually put first the interest of my patient. I say first do benefit, first deliver benefit. Okay. At the end of the day, that's what every person wants when they talk to their doctor. I need, I need help. What can you do to help me? You don't want somebody who says, well, you know, I could help you, but I, I've got this like pledge, so I'm not going to help you. I'm somebody that leans forward and said, let's, 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 uh, let's uh, invert that and let's put the person first. Let's use science to actually as the reason to be able to do it. And most people, 
you know, uh, would would love to to meet the doctor in the middle to be able to get the benefit of that. Okay, so that's for medicines. Now I've spent a lot of time in in medicines, uh, and I still am involved with drug development. So I'm not one of these doctors, even though I. I I work on food and food is medicine. I'm definitely not one of those doctors that basically gets up in a soapbox and waves a, a, a frond of kale to say, never mind your med your medicine cabinet. That's all BS. You know, just eat, you just eat, you know, your, your plant-based foods and you're all set. No, actually f the way I look at it is food is a tool in the toolbox. Um, medicines are another tool in the toolbox. And just like a real toolbox, when you're actually trying to build something constructive like your health, you want to be able to sometimes use more than one tool, you know, uh, for a particular project. And so this is why I also find similarly the rejection that a lot of regular medical doctors have, MDs have, on the role of nutrition to be kind of like the wrong instinct. Just because you didn't learn nutrition in medical school doesn't mean that it's useless. And and so uh, and we so there's real evidence now that shows that food and medicine can work together. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, there was a study at the University of North Carolina involving young, healthy people during flu season getting a, a flu vaccine, right? You get a flu vaccine during flu season. And the thing about flu vaccine is that, you know, you want it to really work well. You want your immune system to rear itself up and basically, you know, be able to battle off the flu. And what they did, though, is they, they knew that there was a, a substance, natural substance, natural chemical in broccoli that is called sulforaphanes. These are natural chemicals. They kind of give broccoli that sulfury taste, that characteristic taste. Um, and so they were thinking about how can we give this to broccoli, this broccoli substance to people, because we know that sulforaphanes activate your immune system. So uh, making them eat a lot of adult broccoli, grown up broccoli and stems, that's a lot of work. So they took broccoli sprouts instead. Now broccoli sprouts, which you can get in most grocery stores these days, three to four day old baby broccoli, okay? Um, they have a hundred times more sulforaphane than the grown up broccoli. So it's like when the broccoli seed sprouts, it's got all the sulforaphanes it's ever gonna have. It just kind of distributes it, you know, into the gigantic mass, the big tree that it be ultimately becomes. So then they made a shake out of these broccoli sprouts and they gave half of the subjects in their research, um, everybody got a flu shot, half of the people got the broccoli shake to have two cups along with a day with the flu vaccine. And they did it only for four days, a very short period of time. And then they looked at the blood, they drew their blood and they looked at their immune system. And guess what? The people who, everybody who got the flu vaccine had some response, but the people who had the flu vaccine and were drinking the broccoli shake, sprout shake, two cups a day for four days, it's eight cups only, had a immune response that was 22 times higher. Their natural killer T cells were 22 times more activated. And then when they actually swabbed their nose to look for flu, there was absolutely nothing found in the people who had the vaccine plus the sprouts, whereas the people who just had the vaccine alone had a little bit of flu virus that they could actually find in their nose. Okay, so again, this kind of shows you that it's not food versus medicine. I didn't say, you know, they tested broccoli sprouts versus vaccine. This is actually putting it together. So the next time, you know, um, uh, someone goes to their doctor to say, hey, you know, um, what, should I be, what should I be eating? This is the kind of information that medical doctors should be sharing with their patients uh, when it comes to improving their health. You know, we recently had... Uh... We recently had Dr. John Abramson on the podcast. I'm not sure you're for, familiar with his work, but he's an expert witness, family physician, and somebody that's been involved in some of the largest uh, litigation trials when it comes to drug company malfeasance over the years, including Biox. And he's uh, a guest lecturer at Harvard and, um, and uh, really just an all-around uh, great dude. He wrote a book called Sickening. And one of the things he was saying is that there also is when we come to this education gap, because most of the education that's being done for medical doctors who are just trying to survive and keep up with the patients and just try to do their best, a lot of the education that's being provided on interventions is coming from the drug companies themselves. And in most cases, we are not demanding that the drug companies do a study like you're talking about. So often when it comes in and it says, hey, metformin, you know, reduced uh, X, Y, and Z, or, or you know, uh, this drug did X, Y, and Z, we don't have or force the, the, the drug companies to look at compared to what? Compared to what lifestyle intervention 
that is also there. And maybe that the drug would work even better if we combined the aspects. There was one study that I mentioned in his book, which was the definitive study on uh, diabetes that was done in the uh, late 90s and how when you combine, uh, just as you were sharing in your example, um, uh, drug with the lifestyle changes, and when you had highly motivated uh, patients that went through the lifestyle changes alone, they got even better results than than the drug. So I think part of this goes back to number one, education, and number two, maybe even raising the standards a little bit in terms of what we think is possible when we're asking drug companies or the NIH to look into the effectiveness of uh, different treatments and how they compare. Sometimes drugs are going to work better. Sometimes drugs in combination with lifestyle or food is going to be maybe the best approach. But we wouldn't know until we did the study. You know, I'm so glad you you brought that example up. Um, type 2 diabetes is definitely a reversible disease. And one of the very, with diet and lifestyle, and one of the things that um, I always um, try to teach other young up and coming doctors is a little bit of my own philosophy, which is, although I've written plenty of prescriptions in my, in my day, and still do, uh, the reality is, is that whenever I give somebody a medicine, my goal is to take them off it. Okay. Like that's, that, that to me is the, is a sign of somebody who, uh, is really trying to restore somebody back to health. If all you're doing is chasing the same disease with a renewal of prescription time, year, t- day after day, week after week, year after year, you're just chasing the horse after it's out of the barn. You're never going to catch it. Okay. And then you're just going to add more medicines, more prescriptions to it when it doesn't work. If every doctor's goal was to actually get people back to health so they don't need to be on the medicine anymore, the goal is to stop the drug um, uh, prescription. Um, even as you start it, you can figure out like, how can I work with the patient so, so they don't need it anymore? That's where you can do a lot of education of the patients and look at the evidence to see what it is it's gonna take. And by the way, I mean, movement, physical activity, 30 minutes of uh, you know good aerobic exercise every single day, that, that, that goes a long way to actually lowering the risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease and even dementia, not to mention obesity. And, and those are easy things to, for the medical doctor to actually um, say, so you don't have to get in your car and drive to the drugstore to do that. But you do want to actually combine that with your medicines until you don't need the medicines anymore, which takes the partnership of the patient and their doctor. So, um, uh, and, and by the way, I think you, if you want to like take this example and move it all the way to like the 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 the, uh, the cliff edge of life and death. Let's talk about cancer. Okay. Now I'm a cancer researcher. I've taken care of plenty of cancer patients, um, uh, even though I'm an internal medicine doctor. And so m- this is a scary subject for a lot of people uh, to deal with. But because this is like my this is like my wheelhouse to work in this, I want to tell you that you know I never thought in my career uh, that I would see the kinds of results we're getting today with some of the most advanced cancer treatments, which involve your health defense, the immune system. It turns out that the immune system, when you give immunotherapy against cancer, is just allowing your immune system to do what it always wants to do, which is to find hidden cancer cells, whether they're tiny and microscopic, whether they're big and spread in your brain, everywhere else, and allow your immune system to just wipe out the cancer. That's what, it, that's what it's designed to do. One of the things that your immune system is designed to do in the same way it can wipe out an infection, okay, uh, in your lung, like a pneumonia, your, your immune system can also wipe out cancer. And I've seen now, first it was just one person and I could barely believe it. Then it was another one. Then it was another. Then it even involved my own mother where, you know, she had metastatic endometrial cancer. We gave her immunotherapy and diet. And I'll come back to that in a second. Wow, her her 80-year-old immune system was powerful enough to wipe out all the cancer in her body, and she never even got any chemo, all right? So this is what's possible now, but diet, what we eat, affects our immune system. So we know, for example, that if you have good, strong immunity, if you, get immuno, if you take immunotherapy, then your immune system is ready to rock against the cancer. But if your immune system's weak, okay, uh, not being ma- maximally supported, by diet, then, you know, it might not perform the way it needs to perform. So this immunotherapy, which can be really amazing, miraculous, I would actually use that word, um, works, some of them only work in about 20% of people, meaning 80% of the people don't respond. So the big hunt 
has been what makes a responder from a non-responder because you know you want 20 you want all all 100% to respond well it turns out now we're beginning to get the clues okay uh, there was a study published recently looking at uh, 200 some patients with melanoma deadly form of skin cancer that had spread and they were getting immune therapy the immune therapies are things like pembrolizumab or they call checkpoint inhibitors you know for your listeners it doesn't really matter what the name is just called them immune therapies that you know, allow your own immune system to go after and wipe out cancer. And when I'm talking about wiping out cancer, I'm talking about basically like the eraser and a dry erase board. And you just get up there, write the word cancer and just scrub it away. That's basically what your immune system actually does at when it's at its best. So who are the people that actually respond? First clues are coming out. This study was done by the MD Anderson Cancer Center along with the National Institutes of Health. And what they found that the responders had one bacteria when you looked in their poop that the non-responders didn't have. And that one bacteria of the gut microbiome, gut health, was called ruminococcus, okay? Wow, one bacteria seems to make the difference between whether you respond and maybe save your life versus don't respond. That's profound, right? Okay, uh, and, and think about how many cancer patients are on antibiotics that, might could, that could also uh, affect that. So then they took it one step further and they said, well, wait a minute, ruminococcus is healthy gut bacteria or microbiome grows when you actually eat dietary fiber. What were these people eating that got the ruminococcus? They were eating dietary fiber. And it turns out the more fiber they ate, the more ruminococcus they have, the more ruminococcus they had, the more likely they would respond to immunotherapy treatment for cancer, life or death in melanoma. And what they found, they were able to calculate this for every five grams of dietary fiber that a patient ate a day. How much is five grams of dietary fiber? Not very much. That's the that's amount of fiber you get in a medium-sized pear. That's five grams a day. Decrease the r risk of mortality by 30%. 30%. Huge. Food and medicine together. Okay, so one of the things that you know we know is that you're supposed to eat you know uh, anywhere from 20 to 40 grams of fiber a day. Most people don't even eat that much. This calls into focus the fact that we do need to take care of our dietary patterns, especially when you're ill. And you know, when cancer patients act their oncologists, what they should be eating, this is the kind of data that they should be talking about. They should be sharing this kind of information because you know the oncologists are not gonna write uh, a prescription for them at home. They're not going to the chemo infusion unit um, to get a pair, but this is something that you can do for yourself at home. One of the coolest sections in the book is where you walk us through sort of a day in the life of this Mediterranean approach. Um, we have the book so we can open that section or you can just recount it if you remember it, like some of the highlights of like, what does it look like if we're going to take these ancient ways, but we're going to incorporate it into a modern lifestyle of like, okay, people are asking kind of like, well, what am I eating throughout the day, especially in contrast to the typical sort of American uh, lifestyle of breakfast, lunch, and dinner and how that's organized? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, I will I will tell you exactly how I do it because it's very consistent every single day. I, I'll make different choices every day, but the, my approach is very consistent every single day. And it starts with breakfast. I mean, and I'll, I'll I'll throw in a few nuggets of of what I talk about in the book as well. Please. When I wake up in the morning, um, I never eat food right away. I take the time to kind of get ready. If I take a shower, I get dressed. I'll catch up with some emails or whatever it is. I I. I I change up the the pattern, the habit that I grew up, you know, like all of our mommies told us to get up and hurry up and eat some breakfast so we can get on the school bus to get to school, <laughs> right? And so we stuff ourselves with food. I never do that because our body doesn't do that. And I know that if I get up and I take a little bit of time to get ready, like about an hour-ish is probably, uh, that's what I did this morning. I did some other stuff for an hour before I sat and had anything to eat. Um, that gives my um, fasted time, my low insulin time, my body, an extra hour to burn extra energy, to burn down extra body fat. It's part of my extension of my intermittent fasting that I do when I'm actually sleeping. All right. And so I get up and I do that. So, and what do I eat? Choices I made this morning. Um, uh, I had some coffee. I'm just sort of thinking through. Um, I had a cup of coffee. I almost always have coffee in the morning. I know it's got chlorogenic acid. I don't put a lot of dairy in it. I mean, I like I had I like my coffee black, but sometimes I'll have a little uh, a little dairy, but not very much light. Um, uh, I had some berries. I ordered some uh, berries this morning. I'm staying at a hotel. I looked at room service, and what what could I find? That was like my centerpiece for my for for berries. 
Um, I, uh, they had some organic free range eggs. I wanted some protein and eggs. So I wanted to get some protein. So I had some eggs. Um, I just had them scrambled very simply with a little bit of olive oil. I, I specified that. Um, uh, and, uh, and they also had some sides. I had some tiny little mushrooms that were actually sauteed in the sides because I know it has dietary soluble fiber. Um, and, and that's basically what I had for my breakfast. Um, and, and again, I didn't have a lot. Um, uh, I, I didn't finish everything that was brought up to me. Uh, I, I don't belong to the clean plate club. I quit that a long time ago. Um, I don't like food waste, but you know, I'm going to only eat enough to satisfy, but not feel full. You felt satiated. I felt, I felt good. And you by the way, getting out of willpower, you were just like, okay, cool. I'm good. I'm, I'm cool. complete. And by the way, you know, I, I was also, when I eat, I actually stay in touch with my body. So I don't, I don't wolf food down. Uh, when you wolf food, that's when you tend to overeat because uh, you're 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 putting f- food, i.e., fuel in your body faster than your body can process the loading, the filling up the tank to your brain. But when I when you eat slowly, like I, you know, I, I, this morning I probably ate breakfast over forty five minutes. You know, I mean, I wasn't sitting there methodically eating the breakfast. I was doing some other things uh, as well. But I ate slow, so actually. Before long, you know, my body said, you know, you're, you're good. I don't feel like another bite of anything, you know? So I didn't feel like, and by the way, that's an important thing. Quit the clean plate club. Because if you feel like you have to clean everything on your plate, like your mom and your teacher and the cafeteria lady told you, all right, who's, who, put that, who put that amount of food on your plate? Now, when I serve myself, I will actually be very conservative, not put too much on, all right? But when somebody else serves you, I always make sure I don't feel compelled to actually clean the plate out of a sense of duty. Now, I, it's true. Like we do want to be, we don't want to waste food. But so anyway, so that's, that would be like my typical breakfast. And can I ask one question about yeah. breakfast? Sometimes people hear the advice and I've experimented a little bit with myself that especially in the morning, now you had eggs in your case, mm-hmm. starting off with you know, a healthy source of protein, whatever that might match your dietary yep. you know, standards in your life, protein is very satiating. And you don't feel hungry for a lot of other things, especially if people are at the beginning stages of maybe wanting to lose a decent amount of weight. Any thoughts about that? Is, do you feel like that's that can work for some people? That doesn't work. You know, it's about think, just yeah. No, I mean, I think that it 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 it'll be different for every individual. But yeah, if you actually eat proteins uh, uh, and foods that actually provide more satiation, meaning that you just feel fuller longer, uh, that'll help you not overeat. But the, but the one caveat to that, that Please. is that if then if you wait too long and then you get really, really hungry and then you are tempted to overeat again, mm-hmm. you know, so just delaying the time to eat actually doesn't, doesn't prevent you from overeating. Yeah. Got it. So I think that what you want to do is to stay in tune with, uh, with your body. I mean, like a good example of, um, something people might not think about, you know, like the traditional English breakfast, it's meat heavy, blah, 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 you know, maybe not so good for you, but it's got a tomato. Tomato is actually good for you. Uh, It's got (laughs) lycopene in it. And sometimes it's got beans. And depending on how the beans are actually cooked, beans are a good source of protein. It's also a good source of dietary fiber and it's actually satiating. And I write about beans in my book where actually if you eat beans on a regular basis, you can actually shrink your weight circumference um, as well. And so again, there's metabolic activation depending on what you eat, as long as you don't eat too much. Yeah. Which goes back to the whole thing. If you are generally eating food, I, I don't know anybody personally who's eating a primary whole foods diet and, you know, which usually requires you to make food, unless if you're very well off and you have a chef making food for you, but the vast majority, including myself, is going to be you're making food that you struggle with if you've been you're on that it's just a lot harder to overeat not that you can you you definitely can you can overeat on any kind of approach but it's really the ultra processed foods and then even in the wellness category you have not all processed foods are bad right almond milk is processed this is you know olives are processed so it's not all processed foods are bad but where i see it challenging for even people in the wellness community who sometimes write to me or 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 you know i see them writing on social media and i'm reading comments is people who are eating a lot of processed forms of like quote unquote healthy foods like healthy <laughs> oreos oreos at the end of the day they're still oreos and i guess you could still call those processed foods or you're eating a lot of 
chips in your diet or, you know, yeah, sure, it's cassava, but you're having all these concentrated calories that would be a lot harder for you to have that much cassava if you were just eating it plain. Yeah. Well, here's, here's a great example. I mean, 100%. But he, And here's an example. Please. Uh, when you do ultra processed foods like chips, you can take wholesome, good ingredients, convert them into a form that doesn't exist in nature, uh, and then reshape them and fry them or whatever it is. You've taken something that might be actually originally healthy and you've turned it into something that's not so healthy. Think about like purple corn chips, right? Uh, or, or uh, frankly, even corn, corn chips. You can actually take uh, 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 something that in, inherently has some nutritional value uh, that's good for you, and you can just convert it into something from healthy into something that's not so healthy. Um, but you can also take healthy and minimally process it and turn right. it into something that is less healthy than the original form. This is back to the whole um, conversation about whole foods. So here's an example I read about in my book. Um, orange juice is uh, good. Uh, people criti critique it for having a lot of added sugar or had a lot of sugar, very sweet. Um, and that's actually true. Um, but that doesn't mean you should avoid oranges because it turns out that oranges, like citrus, has a ton of dietary fiber. Think about peeling a, a mandarin or whatever. It's a ton of dietary fiber in there. It's got vitamin C. It's got hesperidin and aerogenin, all kinds of good, actually, metabolism-activating bioactives. Um, uh, but And you would eat those. And that's what you call nutrient-dense if you have an orange, for example. Now, orange juice, which in moderation, uh, and if you have the pulp and everything and you make it yourself – can also be quite good. You're not going to be having all the same pulp. You're not going to be having all the bits because you leave a lot behind when you're squeezing the orange. But think about it. A tall glass of orange juice takes eight oranges on average to actually make. All right. That's eight oranges. And you can gulp that down. You can swig down a big tall <laughs> glass of orange juice in seconds. But you would never eat eight, sit down and eat eight oranges probably. Right. And that's the point. The whole food versus even minimally processing, like like turning into a juice, can make all the difference between having that much extra fructose sugar, natural sugars, and then uh, even though it's nutrient dense, now you've actually swigged it down long before that you know that you would have even notice that you actually pounded so much sugar into your body. Well, I interrupted you and you were taking us through your day. So you talked about you know, coffee, some berries, a little bit of protein with the eggs, not always belonging to the clean plate club, you know, you know, watching your portions in there, not feeling like you have to eat the whole thing. So take us from yeah. there. And I want to say one more thing about breakfast, because sometimes I will skip breakfast. Yeah. Sometimes I'll skip breakfast because I'm busy. Sometimes I'll skip breakfast because I don't feel like eating breakfast. And so I think this idea of breakfast being the most important meal of the day Actually, most people don't know this. That was a marketing message. Some agency came up with that, you know, from cereal from the cereal companies, like I think in the 1960s or 70s. So that's a complete myth. Uh, uh, and you know, if you skip breakfast, all you're doing is you're giving your body a little bit more chance to metabolize <laughs> extra fuel in your body. So sometimes when I do that, I, I won't feel like I've got to go snack on something crappy, right? I mean, that's the other thing. If you skip breakfast, now you're going to reach for some crappy snacks in the morning. Don't do it. So for me. I will then look for lunch and I tend to eat lunch, a light lunch. I try not to eat a heavy lunch. Um, I, you know, the, 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 the idea of eating a salad for lunch, I will sometimes do that. Sometimes I'll have a, soup, a, a bowl of soup. Sometimes I'll have a stew, um, you know, have a little, little bowl of stew, something, something that's not too heavy, a small amount uh, for, for lunch. Uh, I do I like to build my meals around um, vegetables whenever I can. Uh, and, and if it's cooked, I even like it better because I think it's tastier, you know. So I, if I saw uh, something like uh, bok choy or or sautéed spinach, I'll gravitate towards that. And I tend to look if I'm at a restaurant, I'm looking at a menu for lunch, you know, if I'm, I'm out traveling or working. Uh, I'll actually look for something on the ve vegetable side to actually order as kind of like my quote main. And I try not to order too much more other than that. I'll, I'll or maybe I'll get two little appetizers. Um, Something that's tasty. I, I look for tasty things. I should say that's that's the most important thing. I look for the ingredients that I recognize. A beet salad with some uh, pecans or something like that. Hey, you know what? That sounds pretty good. Uh, a little bit of um, vinegar, a little little dressing with banyul vinegar, apple cider vinegar. Oh, that looks pretty good too. I will I will recognize these things from the work that I've done, and I'll uh, and that's what I really try to encourage people to do is start to recognize the ingredients that are actually good for you and tasty at the same time. And I'll go for that. So I'll eat kind of a lighter lunch, 
the one thing that I, if I skip breakfast, I'll I want to make sure that I actually don't eat, overeat at lunch. And so I will almost deliberately make sure that I'm eating kind of a lighter lunch. I don't want to feel loaded over overloaded after lunch. I'm like my I'm brain dead. Feel sluggish. Sluggish. Low yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's the key is not to overeat. Um, and again, if I'm kind of navigating along the Mediterranean um, kind of genre, you know, I probably won't, I probably will not order a big heavy pasta for lunch, you know, but I might order again, kind of like a couple of appetizery kind of things, um, or I'll make a salad. You know, another thing that's sometimes good for lunch, I'll sometimes look at leftovers from whatever I made for dinner. Yeah. Right. And I'll take a small amount of that. And because I, if I try to cook some health, healthy, tasty food, I'll, I'll have a. I'll, it'll be it'll be another treat for me uh, that I'll look forward to eating the next day. So then, moving on to dinner, you know, I always build my dinners based on what the vegetable actually is. So you know, some people look for their protein. What's my? Am I going to have chicken or I'm going to have whatever it is? And they kind of build and the vegetables or condiments on the side. Even when I'm designing my own meal, I will try to say what's fresh or local or I can get my hands on or on the menu that I want to make kind of a centerpiece. And I'll look at how it's prepared and what are all the ingredients, other ingredients I want to add to it or make it. And then I'll add things around that. And that's how I, you know, again, I think you correctly pointed out, there's so much made. We're all, we're being hit over the head with the, with the slogan of plant-based food, plant-based eating. But to me, I know that I'll be able to get really good dietary fiber and polyphenols if I actually choose that. Got to be tasty. I don't want to eat it if it's not that tasty. And then I'll, then I'll start to build my meal around it. Same deal if I'm actually uh, 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 cooking or whether I'm uh, uh, eating out, dining out uh, at a restaurant. You know, I'm invited to somebody's house. Same deal. Like if I, I will take a look at what's 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 on the dinner table, and I will always go for kind of like the veggie the veggie stuff first. That's the first thing I put on my plate, not too much. And then I'm looking at my, through the Mediterranean lens, you know, what are, what, what, what is cooked in a particular direction that I find, I won't do this if I'm, if I'm in somebody's house, I'll, I'll eat whatever they're making, but I'll always gravitate towards the, the healthy and tasty. That's what I'm looking for. And I don't take too much. I leave plenty of white space on my, on my dinner plate to make sure I'm not eating too much. When it's all crowded together, it's a big mountain. You know, like that—that's no good. Uh, that's the buffet style of eating. Um, I, I will never do that. So always leave white space. You want to make sure there's enough white space. And the other thing I do is I never go for seconds. I try to savor the first, right? So like sometimes you get something really tasty in your plate, and like man, you're gonna eat that first, and like oh, I can't wait to go get some more. What I try to do, like eat slowly, take the things that you really know you're gonna like, and savor them. And that's where you're taking your time. That's part of eating mindfully. Like I think if you put enjoyment as part of it, as part of your eating pattern, and then you make sure that you're not taking too much, you're satisfied, but not not uh, you don't you don't feel full. Uh, that allows you to leave the dinner p- party before it's over, kind of thing. Meaning that you know you're not overeating that hara uh, hachi me the you know uh, eat about eighty percent when you're full and then like leave. Those are some of the basic principles of how I how I do it. And again, through the lens, I, I naturally gravitate to say, is there something Asian? Is there a Mediterranean? Or whatever is prepared for me or what's in front of me, I'll try to cherry pick the things that I know that are healthy. And I don't eat too much. I love it. It's great. Um, while we're in the latter part of the interview, I want to talk about these principles. You kind of tease them out a little bit. And these principles really go into the idea of what does it look like to eat to beat your diet? Because it's so much more than just the individual foods that you choose. There's a whole sort of lifestyle in a way. And when we start to, you know, we see these longest living societies, the blue zones, the Asian communities, the Mediterranean communities, which you rightfully highlight that as they've adopted more of the Western diet, even if they're eating their traditional foods, but they're more processed, they're not groups and societies that are as healthy as they once were. Um, but even those groups that are the long living ones, it's not just the individual food. It's kind of like the food is part of their lifestyle as a whole. Uh, alcohol is a perfect example of one. You know, you often hear that the blue zones, all except for Loma Linda, they all have a little tiny amount of alcohol on a regular basis. Now, can we infer that alcohol is good or is that that population can handle it because the rest of their lifestyle is organized? We don't know yet, right? 
or unless if you know. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, I, I have a, I have something to say about alcohol uh, because I get asked this all the time. Dr. Lee, red wine's good for you, right? Well, now, now I just read that red wine's that the wine, all wine's bad for you. All, and what I basically say when it comes to alcohol, because it's 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 a it's a it's a triggering and somewhat controversial uh, point. It is true that many epidemiological studies have shown that you know drinking a glass or two, very moderate red wine, is associated with some beneficial out, health outcomes, lower risk of some diseases. But I will tell you that. In no study, no research is alcohol, ethanol, okay, the stuff that's underlying, you know, your whiskey, your <laughs> beer, uh, uh, your your wine. It's the alcohol is not actually good for you. Alcohol is a toxin, actually. It's a it, it's a um, and and so a little bit though, as you say, if you're mostly healthy and your health defenses and your metabolism is very resilient, human body is amazing. There's no such thing as a super food. It's a super body. Um, and even if we we slug down a, a glass of wine or, or sip a glass of wine or have a drink or two, um, our body will bounce back. It's o- only, again, continuous abuse of that system that will actually break down our engine. But alcohol is something very specific. And here's how I explain it. As long as humans have been growing grain, they've been fermenting it and creating alcohol. Alcohol is part of human tradition. We celebrate main events of our life with it, you know, births, deaths, you know, holidays. It's all part of, it's all, alcohol is part of human society. I don't think we should demonize alcohol. I think that, you know, it, we should just recognize it's part of, it's part of the traditions of human, human tradition, but we should know that uh, in no case is the ethanol actually good for you. It's just something that we, we do. All right. Um, but that, you know, and that's why we should actually think about it as a tradition rather than as a health food. Yeah. Uh, and I think that allows us to actually um, accommodate it uh, in moderation uh, in ways that are actually going to be uh, allowable if that's your preference to celebrate, you know, uh, a wedding with a glass of champagne. Like there's no shame to it. That's a human tradition. We're all human. Uh, embrace that part of who we are. And that's, I think, the thing that I, I try to, that's my contribution in the health and wellness community. I try to use science, but I also try to be reasonable and I try to recognize who we are as humans. The nuance, right? That's where everything is heading towards. We're not all answer for everybody. We're going to sweep it under the table. You know, everybody's got to do the same thing. And generally speaking, if you have all these other components, whether it's alcohol or diet soda that's occasional here and there, it's not going to make a difference. You'll bounce for you, back, right? You're going to bounce back. There's plenty of other crazier things that people do in life. So this goes back to the ten principles that you talk about in the book, and that you close off the book with. And I'm just going to pick a few. We're not going to run through them all. You know, pick up the copy. Pick up a copy of the book. Link in the show notes. You can go through them. I'm going to pick a couple of these that you know we can talk about here. Um, the first one that I want to do is I want to pick something called drink the Trinity. So what is, what is that? What does that mean? And what is the Trinity? Well, in my book, in the part about food, I take people on, I take my reader on a tour through the grocery store, including to the beverage section. And th- literally the way I do this is actually, I invite you to jump into my shopping cart, like you would have when you were a kid in your mom's shopping cart, get pushed through. And I kind of narrate all the things through it. So the beverage section of the grocery store is a pretty confusing section because it's in the middle aisles and there are endless sea of juices and sodas and bottled waters that are there. And so I try to bring a little bit of clarity to, you know, what are the three beverages that are um, unquestionably healthy for you? There's no real controversy of them, all right? Because other drinks like juices and sodas, lots of controversy, lots of data. But the three things I call the holy trinity of beverages um, are water, okay? Water actually uh, is critical for hydration, critical to maintain our health defenses, critical for our metabolism. You need water in the system, okay? Uh, And drinking water is something that is very natural and and important to us. Uh, uh, And again, when you drink cool water, you activate these uh, temperature gauges in our stomach that are triggering our metabolism to kind of warm up uh, the water in our stomach so we don't cool our core body temperature. So there's even metabolic benefits uh, to drinking water. Water is also by satiating. 
So when you actually drink water with a meal, you're naturally stretching out your stomach a little bit. And rather than actually having food in there, that water stretch actually basically slows down your appetite, slows down your hunger as well, which also helps to contribute to preventing you from overeating as well. So water is really good for you. There's no, you know, like it's a, it's a human right to drink water. <laughs> you know, we, we have to drink water. It's really great. Footnote to that. And this is actually something that I think really deserves um, careful uh, research, more careful research is, you know, bottled water, which is so commonly consumed, probably will have microplastics in it. Almost certainly does. And, you know, even though the research doesn't, hasn't clearly nailed what the harm of microplastics are, I would say it's probably not so good for you. We can find it like attached to a red blood cell circulating in our blood. That's, that freaks me out. Actually, think about that. So, if you can drink water, if you can if you can drink water from a source other than bottled water, it's probably preferable. Yeah, but get a filter at home. Get a filter at home. I, yeah. I, there's a great quote that a friend said years ago, uh, an acquaintance said years ago. He said, "Either you get a filter or you become the filter." <laughs> That's actually really true. And our kidney is going to be the filter, and our bloodstream is going to become the filter. Yeah, you don't you don't want to be uh, you don't all that. accumulating these microplastics. Um, but the water is really really a good beverage. Second is tea. We talked a little bit about green tea um, as being beneficial to you. Um, and you know, tea is the second most popular beverage in the world after drinking water. Uh, so we're talking about something that a lot of people have a lot of experience with. But I, but what I point out in my book is not just green tea. It's different kinds of green tea. Matcha tea is actually good for you. Oolong tea, which is slightly fermented green tea, also has metabolic benefits, also has polyphenols. And then for green tea, if you have matcha, you know, which you find in a ceremonial tea, you find in a Japanese restaurant, it's bright green tea. It, it's kind of opaque because it's actually made with powder. And it's the entire tea leaf that's powdered. A lot of people don't realize this, but matcha is super packed with polyphenols. You know why? Matcha is grown in a very particular way. 28 days before they pick the, 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 the tea leaf from, to make matcha, they put it under shade. They, put, they, they basically cover it with a canopy and, and the shade is there. So the tea in response to the tea leaf, tea plant, in response to shade, actually wants to make more polyphenols. So they make anywhere from... 30 to 300 times more polyphenols mm. under the shade, all right? And then what happens when you pick the leaf, you cut off the stem, and then they powder, they dry and powder the entire leaf. And so that's why you have so much more polyphenol. It's like um, a stress response to not having a, enough a, sun. First is a stress response to the plant, but then you get more, rather than having it in a tea bag or loose tea leaves, you actually powder the entire leaf. So you're getting the entire leaf, including all the polyphenols. Mm. So you drink all the polyphenols, which is why you get 30 to 300 times more than just dunking a tea bag, you also get the dietary fiber. Good for your gut microbiome. So matcha tea actually is quite amazing. I actually done a study to show that uh, that uh, matcha tea extracts can kill breast cancer stem cells. Wow. I'm, I'm always amazed by that because look, as somebody who's been involved with biotech development um, and cancer treatment development, finding something that could kill stem cells, cancer stem cells, like breast cancer stem cells, which is what makes cancers come back, is a holy grail. We don't have a drug for it, but here, matcha tea actually been shown in the lab to actually be able to do that to me is actually really jaw dropping. Then going down into even more fermented tea, because traditionally, again, you know, this idea that in our wellness community, we wind up having all these mantras, um, must drink green tea and oxidized fermented tea is no good. Turns out that's not true. The science is showing that oolong tea, which is slightly fermented, also good for your metabolism. You can lose your waist. You can shrink your waist size, your waist circumference, lose body fat. And then even perhaps more surprising, if you take the extreme of fermented smoky dark teas, there's a tea that I write about called Pu'er tea. P-U apostrophe E-R-H. One, -R -H, <laughs> one of your favorites, right? Yeah. One of mine as well. Uh, this is comes from a village of Pu'er that um, back thousands of years actually traded tea on the Silk Road. So they smoked the tea, they fermented it, so it would actually survive the tea journey. And it turns out research had been done to show that poor tea lights up your brown fat, burns up, you know, triggers your fat, excess fat burning by burning the cells, uh, decreases your stem cells from making more fat, uh, and fi whites, uh, fats, visceral fat as well. Quite remarkable that this fermented tea that supposedly, you know, fermented, it's not, can't be good, doesn't have any of the polyphenols left, wrong. And on top of that, they've actually discovered just a few years ago that there is this, this tradition, thousand year old tradition of making poo or tea. There's even a bacteria, a probiotic 
that actually is then the bacteria is grown in the way that's fermented. In fact, they call it a puer silus, uh, like a bacillus <laughs> that actually grows in puer tea. So this is actually a, a probiotic tea, which to me is remarkable. And not only does it improve gut health, it's good for your metabolism as well. So it fires up your brown fat. So again, you know, tea is the second part of the Holy Trinity. The third, um, which I always drink, and you asked me, what did I want? If I, you know, I was coming in to do this podcast with you and I requested a cup of coffee. Coffee has chlorogenic acid and many other polyphenols, but the chlorogenic acid not only boosts your health defenses, um, uh, but it also triggers your metabolism uh, and, and it stimulates your metabolism from going as well. A little bit of the caffeine, which I'm able to tolerate. Not everybody can tolerate caffeine, um, but I'm able to tolerate the caffeine. Caffeine also uh, stimulates not only your kind of like your brain, but also stimulates your metabolism as well. And I'm not encouraging people to go after caffeine. I'm just saying that coffee is one of the, the, the third of the holy trinity, coffee, tea, uh, and water that actually is really, really healthy. You know, the beautiful thing about the way you present it is like Pu'er, one of my favorite teas. I drank it so much during college. Yeah. Like I would drink it all the time. And then I had a little bit of a gap. And then I'm thinking recently, I'm like, you know what? It's probably been a year or two since I've had it. Like when you know the information, it's another reminder of like, oh, this thing that I used to enjoy or that I've heard of or that I heard somebody else having, like, wow, like that's exciting for me. And you include it back into your routine. And all this culminates together. And it really goes into this last principle that you talk about in the 10 principles, which is live to eat, right? The joy of searching out, being a food hunter, forager in our modern world, and really leaning into the idea of not being fear-based around food, but actually, you know, I'll let you set it up. You know, sometimes we hear this phrase, like people say, oh, do you eat to live or do you live to eat? And almost like live to eat has a demeaning tone that people give it in that capacity. Talk about how you're representing it to the audience. Yeah, well, in my book, one of the things that I really try to, and I hope the readers get this, convey is that we don't need to fear our food. The, the very foods that taste great can be actually good for us if we're mindful about how we eat it and when we eat it and all that kind of other stuff and, and, and to find good combinations of it and that these are connected to our old traditions. And that's really how I really became very mindful of this whole idea of um, living to eat. So I did a gap year before I went to medical school to become a doctor. Um, I, I was a biochemist in college and um, I was very enamored by history. And I was always interested in the Mediterranean because when I studied, I took a very influential course called the Renaissance History of Man. And that course fascinated me because it was really talking about that inflection point between the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, and the Renaissance, sort of the Enlightenment, and all the incredible arts and sciences and literature explosion of culture that occurred um, uh, during the Renaissance. Right. And I realized something that was really amazing, which is that at any point, like it didn't happen overnight. It wasn't like, you know, one day it was in a dark room. It's called the Middle Ages. And then one day somebody clicked on a light switch and, oh, it's a Renaissance. No, this actually took place over hundreds of years that this evolution actually occurred. And, it, and I realized that there was something really valuable about this idea of of growing to a higher light, a, a, a stage of enlightenment that occurs over time. I really wanted to see where this occurred, which happened to be in the Mediterranean that I, we were studying in Italy and Greece. So I really wanted to get over there to study it. And then I also realized that the food traditions also, as part of my study, changed dramatically between the Middle Ages, where people were just like, you know, cooking, you know, those gigantic, um, you know, Bronto burgers over a fire to really beginning to, um, understand how ingredients melded together you know the the simmering and the cooking and the stewing like these were not medieval age you know you did have cavemen were doing that but really it's sort of during the middle age that's when the modern asian and mediterranean uh actually cooking techniques came into being so i wanted to see this so before i went to medical school i did a gap year and I went to Italy. I kind of embedded myself, so to speak. And I was—I um, uh, lived with the family, 
And I was there explicitly to study the link between food and culture and health. I wanted to see what it was like over there in Italy and Greece. I traveled all around Italy. Um, uh, and, and I actually also did some cooking uh, for the families I was living with. Uh, in Greece, I went to a monastery. Uh, I, I literally volunteered to be a cook in the monastery <laughs> uh, one day because the abbot announced that the, the chef uh, monk was sick, had the flu. And they needed volunteers and who knew how to cook. And so I raised my hand and off I went in there. We were stirring uh, a ginormous pot of beans with a canoe paddle, literally, and cooking for the entire monastery. This was like wow. cooking Easter feast. And, you know, um, and, and to me, that experience burned into my brain while I was living there that people really enjoyed their food. They knew about their food. They talked about their food. They looked forward to their food. So, you know, if you go to Mediterranean, um, anyone, if, if you knew, have a friend in Italy or in Greece and, and, and they took you out to a meal or cooked a meal for you, while you sat down with your meal, they would be talking about their food. Italians talk about what they're eating as they're eating it, and they talk about the season it is and how to prepare it and different nuances about it. People are passionate about their food. Same thing in Asia, you know, and, and you know, I, I would imagine the same thing as in India. People take the time to prepare their food, and when they serve it, that's what people talk about. They talk about their food, and, and they really, really relish it and enjoy it. And they look forward to their next meal. I think to me, I learned that was the antithesis of what I came back to when I went to medical school, mm. where we were so rushed, you know, we were so busy, we didn't have time to eat. And so when you sat down, it was really just a pile in some sustenance and to get through to get to the next thing. And that to me was, um, uh, you know, I, I really wanted to live to eat as opposed to just eat to live, to pile in some calories so I can keep going. I think I've I've really lived my life that way, and what I hope for people who read my book is that they're, they'll they'll really they'll really see from the way that I write about food that it's something that I I enjoy, it's passionate, and that it's something that you can really look forward to. Like when I was writing some of the things uh, that I wrote, I actually I wrote part of this book by the way in the Mediterranean. I went back, I was doing some research um, in places, um, and I finished I finished my book actually in Greece. I was on a Greek island. Um, and I went to a little writing cave and the food that I would eat, like I would write about afterwards and it would make my mouth water to write about mm. the food I just ate uh, all over again. So, you know, I hope people, I hope readers really get this idea. Like, please don't fear your food, you know, um, love your food. And it's just so amazing that we're so fortunate actually to be able to, you know, benefit from societies and histories and cultures that have actually figured out a lot of stuff for us. Um, uh, and, and now what's cool is that science is bringing us really to the cutting edge, that forefront, where we begin to understand why the things that taste so great are actually so great. Why should we be excited about sunflower seeds? If you can remember some of the key highlights and talking points that you shared about why you like to include this uh, ingredient in your diet on a regular basis. Well, one of the things that I love about sunflower seeds is they, they taste really good. They're nutty. They have this kind of really delicate kind of flavor. Um, it's not a, it's not, and, and they're, and they're not very crunchy. They're, they're kind of soft. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and they're very commonly eaten in the Mediterranean, lightly roasted. Uh, and so it's just a, it's a great uh, treat. It's a good source of dietary fiber, and there's also a bioactive in it called SDG. I'm not going to even bother going into the chemical name, uh, pronounce what the S and the D and the G stands for, but I can tell you that actually it protects your stem cells. And yes, sunflower seeds do belong to the grand slammers, but I will also tell you that the fact that there's dietary fiber to feed your gut microbiome, which helps your metabolism, helps you heal better, makes you feel better, and actually activates your brain and improves your mood, sunflower seeds are a great way of snacking. And the protection against your uh, for your stem cells also means that um, it helps your body renew itself from the inside out. Now, sunflower seeds are something I like to keep around, like a, just a little bowlful, um, like if I'm for a snack, that's the other thing I like about it. You don't have to like, you don't have to eat up like a couple of fistfuls of the stuff for it to be good for you. You just, you can just kind of like uh, chew on them a little bit, bit, bit by bit. And you, you feel totally satisfied and it's a great source of fiber and other bioactives. Does it matter if we eat them raw or not or roasted? Should be, we worried about how much, uh, 
Sodium might come up if they are roasted. Just any kind of considerations. And I guess people could think about this when they're thinking about all sort of seeds and nuts that they want to include in your diet. So we'd love to hear your take on it. Such an important thing. So, you know, like what I do is I buy, I like to buy just a bag of sunflower seeds or cashews or walnuts that isn't actually pre-seasoned. I like to do it myself, honestly, or sometimes like sunflower seeds, I don't mind them when they're not seasoned at all. I kind of like the fact that they're actually even a little sweet, you know, um, and they're not cloyingly sweet, but they're they're definitely not salty. You can salt them if you want, but, the, but be very careful about commercial brand seasoned nuts and seeds because oftentimes they are loaded with salt. Also, sometimes they're loaded with unhealthy oils because the, to roast them, they'll coat them with really unhealthy saturated fats, and then they roast them and they'll dump salt on them and they'll shake all the salt off. And that'll be a pretty tasty bag. That I guarantee you, like it'll be kind of addictive to go through them, but man, your, your sodium will go through the roof. And then if you get the, the barbecued flavors and then the pizza flavored and all those other kinds of things that might sound attractive on the label, just remember, mostly those are seasonings that some of which are synthetic and are engineered to taste like something with artificial, you know, something synthetic. Like that's not what you want. And so I like to go for the elemental natural flavors. If I'm gonna season it, like cashews, I might season myself a little bit. Walnuts, I don't need seasoning. Uh, pecans and almonds, almonds, I don't really need seasoning. But if you're gonna use seasoning, um, just take a little pinch of sea salt, okay? Um, and, and you can just, just, um, just, sprinkle it on it, mix it around. You'll get a little bit of salt, but you do not want to actually, this is not shaker uh, style. You don't definitely want, don't want to do that. Yeah. The interesting thing about it is that the level of sodium that comes in these highly processed snacks that are already prepared for us. I was even using a spice yesterday that is from a very healthy company and known as a healthy company. The spice was organic. It's a pre-seasoning. And I was looking at the back and the bag, which had the spice inside of it that I was using for these uh, chicken thighs that I was making to add to my base salad, my big fat salad, you know, had avocado oil, had olive oil, some avocados, olives, a bunch of really just good and healthy things, including fermented beets. That's usually my sort of chosen way of having uh, beets in my diet and uh, other great vegetables. Anyways, I was looking at the bag on the back and the amount of sodium that was in there was essentially almost 30% of the recommended daily value for one serving of that seasoning that's there. Now, the crazy thing is I was doing the math online about what it would take for me at my house to use salt, right? High quality table salt or Himalayan salt or sea salt to get close to that amount. And what most of us forget is that if we wanted to salt our food at the level that it comes pre-seasoned by processed food companies, some which are still in that quote unquote healthy category, it actually wouldn't taste that good if we used salt ourselves to do that equivalent amount of sodium. You have to engineer it and do all sorts of things to make that amount of salt palatable. So I think for the most part, if people are just using uh, a reasonable amount of sea salt at home uh, just to dust their meal or add a little bit to their roast veggies, you're going to be fine overall. It's actually very hard to get to levels of sodium that are coming in these processed foods that we pick up in the store. So I think the moral of the story, and feel free to disagree or agree, is just overall cutting down the amount of processed foods that we include in our diet, even being very wary of a lot of the healthy processed foods that are now being sold at Whole Foods and other places, because that's really where you get these large quantities of sodium from. Yeah, I mean, it's always buyer beware. And the, the one sort of cheat that every uh, commercial food provider, restaurants included, to, to make their food taste better is salt because salt does make almost everything taste better, just like sugar makes everything uh, taste better. A little bit's okay. Uh, the, the quantities that are often used are not okay. And I think that that's important to remember too. Along those same lines, um, you know, your listeners should actually think about this. When you go to a restaurant, if you were to actually um, uh, go behind the scenes and see how the chefs are actually salting the food, you'd be surprised. They will grab like a like a like a big mound of salt um, and just throw it into a dish sometimes, and it'll taste really great. But you've got way more sodium in there than you ever thought. When I cook at home, I'll tell you. Although, although I um, uh, will. Uh, 
tr- be be very cautious, conscious, cautious not to use too much salt. Here's a little trick that um, people who cook at home can use. So if you're going to saute something in a pan, okay, I, I I usually cook with olive oil over medium heat, not super high heat. I don't want to burn the the stuff in the olive oil, and I wanted to put a little salt, you know, just a little bit of salt. What I, what I don't do is cook the food and then take the salt and throw it into the food after it's done. I will actually sometimes just take a pinch of salt and dust the olive oil while it's heating up. Now you're guaranteed not to actually put too much salt in it because you can see exactly how much salt you're putting in. If you were to put the, like a spoonful of salt in there, you're like, man, I just ruined the whole pan. I can't use that pan. I got to clean it out and do start it all over again. So I think, you know, even when, you, even if you're cooking at home, just having that awareness that, you know, whether it's at home or a restaurant or at a uh, process, ultra process factory, somebody is putting salt in there and it's up to you to determine how much you're going to allow into your body. Yeah. As you mentioned, buyer beware, especially when we're eating out and all the processed ingredients. Uh, and I know there's some healthy debates that are out there about really how much should we be worried about salt at home. And I'd love to get, you know, maybe for another time, it'd be nice to dig into some of those details a little bit more because it can be very confusing for the average person who's uh, listening. But I think by far, at least from the studies that I've looked at, the vast majority of people who have really hot, bad issues with hypertension and uh, and and um, are having challenges where sodium is a major play into their chronic health issues are people who are generally on very high ultra processed foods diets. So if we just stick towards whole foods in general, we're going to be in a better boat to begin with than people who just literally can't control it because they're primarily getting most of their calories from ultra processed foods that are there. But uh, yeah, we'll revisit that topic another time. Um, You know, Dr. Lee, you're always coming across new information, things that make you excited. And I feel you do such a great job about sharing that. As we start to wind down, uh, for today's uh, interview, I'd love to just toss it back to you. And I don't often do this in podcasts because I value myself as somebody who's very prepared and going through and has his exact list of topics that he wants to chat about. But because I have you here and I know you're always thinking about new stuff, is there anything that we didn't get a chance to talk about today that you'd love to share with our audience? Well, you know, one of the things that I think we haven't talked about is um, seasonality of food. And, you know, um, most of us live in places that do have seasons um, and seasons dictate what's actually available in the market uh, and what's grown locally. And so one of the things that I think that uh, I always try to tell people to do is just to be more conscious, mindful, aware of like where we are. You know, like a lot of us spend a lot of time in a car or in an office building or in your home office, whatever the case may be. But actually, you know, there's a functioning world that we live in and that rotating planet goes through seasons and the markets that are available, uh, even in a big supermarket, like the stuff in the front where they offer it up, oftentimes will come from local growers. And so I encourage people always to go look for the local stuff and and just get a sense of what's what comes out when. I mean, we know strawberries come out um, in the summertime. We, uh, but many people don't realize that citrus and pears actually are coming out more in the winter months, you know? And so if you start to think about like what's seasonal, if you go to these traditional food cultures, whether it's in Asia or whether it's in Europe, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the people who are older, who live simpler lives, they're pretty, they're pretty well aware of what, what time of the year certain things come up. When do chestnuts come out? They come out in the fall, you know? And again, I think that the being in, being aware of not just where you live, but when you live is actually can say something that can help you make some choices as well. Um, the other thing that I think that, that um, I think is really interesting to think about being, being it's all about awareness is um, back in the day, um, the uh, back in the day, the uh, idea of not having enough food made you hungry. So you were, uh, uh, forging, foraging, looking for food to be able to get your energy requirements in. Now that we're surrounded by food, there's something called hedonic uh, eating. And so we're eating because our brain is seeking some other reinforcement besides energy requirements to survive. And I think that what we need to do is to realize that even when we're really happily eating, whether it's at a buffet or whether it's at a Thanksgiving dinner, when you actually are surrounded by plenty, 
the hedonic eating center in your brain is lit up. And that's also a time to be cautious because it's so easy to overeat. And that old Japanese saying, harahachiban mi, which is, you know, just eat 80% and, and stop, you know, quit the clean play club, leave before, leave the party before it's over kind of thing is another way to actually prevent overeating, which is a whole other topic um, that we can talk to uh, talk about at some other point that can be really, really harmful to overload our body as well. And so I think the key, I, you know, the two things I was saying is number one, think about when you live, the time of the year, and that can be a useful guide for actually what you buy and what you see, what you prefer in a marketplace, just to be in tune with who you are, where you are, when you are. And the other thing is really to recognize that, you know, we, we, when we, when as an animal, we eat for our energy and for survival. But when we're surrounded by food, because we now live in a, in a time of plenty, the reality is there's these, these things called hedonic center in our brain, hedonism, right? We just love to eat. And the key thing is to just be really mindful when you're surrounded by food, could be a, it could be a time that you need to be most cautious so you don't overeat and overtax your body with calories as well. Do you think that one way of hedging against that is to have a regular practice of intermittent fasting? So you just know that you have this window and then when you're outside of that window, it's just your normal time to give your body a rest? Yeah, well, that's really what the latest research is showing. And, and some of this research is coming from anti-aging and longevity research as well. Um, you know, it, it, this is really fascinating. About 20 years ago, they found out from lab rats and, and lab animals that if you actually fed them 30% less than what they would have. So most people don't, who aren't in research, may not know this, but you know, you, you go into these uh, uh, research facilities and you know, the, there's veterinarians that actually measure out how much food the animals are getting. So their experiments were done 20 years ago where they were cutting down the amount of food by like 30%. And they found that, th that when animals had their foods cut down or calories cut down by 30%, they lived longer. They're they actually triggered a program for longevity. And that's where a lot of this interest in fasting, intermittent fasting, caloric restriction, and longevity came in. But I'll tell you, caloric restriction um, uh, is just a useful thing because we don't, we shouldn't be. Human bodies not intended to be continuously eating. You know, that all day snacking, not good for us. You do want to give your body a rest. Um, it, it's like never shutting off your computer. You know, you want to give all of your health defenses, your digestive system, your metabolism, and even your brain, um, you know, because uh, uh, when you're eating food and you're putting fuel in your body, your brain's continuously churning as well. You know, we don't we don't want to overtax our bodies. Give it a rest. Intermittent fasting, caloric restriction. Those are actually really good practices. And by the way, I bet more people than we realize are actually practicing intermittent fasting because if you're a busy person, a busy mom, busy executive, you know, busy rushing around getting things done, you might be missing a breakfast or a lunch every now and then. And that's okay. I think that, you know, I, I know when I was in medical school, I, I can't tell you the number of, of, uh, of breakfast or lunch that I had to skip because I was always behind. Uh, I, I was, uh, I, you know, I had to rush to do something else. Or I was just way too busy to be able to do it. And actually, the, the good news is that your body thanks you for that. Absolutely. When you build that on top of a good whole foods based diet that is actually leaning towards a balanced blood sugar so that you're not having so many spikes throughout the day, which have their own inflammatory reaction, then it's like, you're not even hungry. Where I see sometimes people run into trouble is if they're still basing their diet on things that are not kind of helping them stay even, the healthy fats, uh, the healthy plant-based foods that are out there, uh, the, the things that sort of are good for their microbiome, but also good for their blood sugar. And uh, when they're not eating those foods and instead they're eating a lot of refined carbohydrates and basing their diet around that, or even a lot of things with sugar or added sugar, then it's very actually really tough to do things like intermittent fasting. And because your body's sort of just like, I need that next hit. So you got to give it to me. Yeah, no, that's, that's so true. And, and again, you know, one of the most important things that you can do is to know yourself better. And a lot of us are just so busy with life. We don't take the time, you know, the amount of time you take in the morning to, to brush your hair, shave, brush your teeth, put on your makeup, you know, um, 
like we do that every day. Like those are people, you know, they're, they're, that's a ritual that we actually brush our teeth, uh, all that kind of stuff. And I actually think that, you know, one of the things that we uh, um, could ta also take the time to do is just to even a little bit of time every day, just to think about how you're going to be mindfully choosing the food you're going to put into your body, as opposed to mindlessly putting things into your body. Um, don't forget when it comes to food and health, it's not just about um, the food, it's about how your body responds to whatever you put inside it. You put something bad inside, it's going to react negatively. Nobody wants that. You put something good inside your body, your body will react positively. And especially if it's food that you already love, then you're actually getting something that you want that brings you joy and health at the same time. Understanding why, when you look at a graph and you saw this explosion of obesity and overweight individuals around the globe, but in particular America, the answer from that, from that traditional world is, hey, this is all about calories in, calories out. When we had an explosion of industrialization, we were more sedentary, so we weren't moving as much. And we also, yes, had more processed and especially ultra processed foods mm -hmm. and ultra processed foods are not inherently bad in this kind of world classic worldview. It's just that they're a concentrated source of calories and they are in general going to make you eat more. So yes, there's all this fancy stuff that people are talking about weight and weight gain, but from our lens, again, just taking this side of the argument, cause I want to get your perspective on it. It's excess calories leads to a situation where you are building up excess fat and there's nothing inherently that's causing that besides the fact that we are probably concentrating calories and we have more of a sedentary lifestyle. Give me your perspective on that view. What part of that might have some truth to it and what part of that might not be the full picture? Well, it's definitely not the full picture. It, and it also is true. It's sort of, it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that's actually true. Um, if you stuff yourself with a lot of calories, um, that energy has got to go someplace. I'm going to explain to that in a second. Uh, but, but I think that it's way more than the taking the side of calories in versus calories out. Let me go back to that car analogy we talked about, Please. the fuel. All right. So if you were um, low on gas, and you pulled over your car to the filling station and you filled up the gas tank. Imagine if your the nozzle didn't have the clicker so that when your tank was full, um, you would actually stop, right? <laughs> now, our bodies aren't built with a clicker. And so what happens is that we can actually um, uh, keep on filling up our tank. Imagine if you were filling up your car with gas and, uh, and you didn't have the clicker, what would happen? The gas tank would fill up. It would overflow the tank, run down the side of the car, around the wheels, and just start pooling around your feet. And you'd be standing in a pool of highly dangerous, flammable, toxic uh, uh, fuel right around you, right? And hopefully you step away from that, then the air will eventually evaporate uh, the, the gas. Now, in our human body, we don't have that clicker. And so the, uh, so the fuel that we use for our body's engine uh, comes from food. We call it calories, right? So then we're eating our food is our fuel. We remember we talked about the high, better quality fuel means your engine is going to run longer. Uh, but what happens is that if you – so whatever you need to just kind of run your baseline engine, it's got, your, your insulin is going to absorb that right away. Anything excess when you're actually loading fuel into your body, your body's going to stuff it into those little tiny little fat cells around your blood vessels. All right. And those blood vessels are going to get a little bit bigger. If you keep on stuffing food, the, the little fat cells are going to get bigger, fat cells, bigger, bigger. They're stretched out like a water balloon. All right. Um, and then when, when those are completely filled, if you keep on eating more calories in, more fuel, all right, now your body's going to have to make some new storage tanks. More fat gets created. And then the extra fuel gets stored into those little fat cells, which get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, repeat that. Copy and paste that. You know, rinse and repeat that 10,000 times. And you can kind of see how if you continuously eat too much and you overstuff calories, look, your body's just going to make more fat to store that fuel, right? Now, the, remember we talked about that, that fat, as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it needs more blood vessels. If it can't grow them fat enough, fast enough, it'll actually starve in the middle. You have hypoxia and now you get inflammation, all right? And so what happens is that now... Instead of standing in a pool of dangerous flammable gas, you are now having inside your body because your food doesn't run out around your pools around your feet. It just gets stuffed in all the corners of your body. Now you actually have this flammable stuff, inflammable stuff inside your body. That's the, how I kind of explain 
that traditional way of thinking about calories in and calories out, yeah, you do need to burn your calories. I mean, we all burn our calories continuously just by being awake and blinking, but we want, we're looking for balance. Okay. And and this is where the consumption and overconsumption in an era of abundance actually can be very, very dangerous. And the uh, lifestyles we talked about, you know, having exercise and sleep and stress management along with um, food and, you know, not just what to eat and how much to eat, but when to eat, all those things can actually kind of converge. So This is where metabolism becomes wonderfully complex because it feeds into how our body naturally wants to operate. What's our operating system, right? When you're on your laptop, you know, you're not thinking about how your operating system works. You just use your computer. But I think when we start seeing there's problems with your operating system, problems with our metabolism, problems with our body fat, then it's worth it to actually take the time to kind of figure out what can I do to actually streamline my operating system. And so part of that, what I'm hearing is that, you know, essentially our modern lifestyle, which of course filled with chronic stress and all these lifestyle factors that are there, but also food wise, if the food is primarily coming from ultra processed ingredients, you don't have that ability to turn on your body's clicker. So you don't actually have the ability to tell yourself, Hey, I'm full. I'm satiated. I don't need anything else. When we look around the world and we see these sort of societies that have maintained a little bit more of their traditional food and lifestyle, their way of life and many of the foods that you talk about in in your sort of new term for this this diet, it's not a diet, but it's sort of a way of eating, um, the, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean uh, way of approach, which we'll talk about, that activates more of these clickers and doesn't let your fat run the show. When your fat is running the show, it's like all hell brace, breaks loose and you start craving more of that. That's why some people literally feel like, I don't have any control. My body is sort of controlling me. And in a way, what you're saying is that sometimes it might be because that fat is literally hijacking the system. Yeah, no, that's really true. Uh, And, you know, I would also say that ultra processed foods, artificial preservatives, artificial flavorings, artificial colorings, they're present in most of the ultra processed foods that we actually find. True, we're starting to see more organic and natural. And uh, but if you take compare United States and Europe, in Europe they've actually regulated out a lot of these artificial preservatives and uh, flavors and colorings that we routinely see. You know, I, I was just coming, you know, coming to see you. I flew, went through the airport and I went into you know one of those typical uh, newsstands, magazine stands, and looked at the snack foods. And there are healthy foods like tree nuts, like walnuts and pecans and almonds. And when I picked up the the the, uh, the bag and I looked at the ingredients, they were filled with artificial flavorings and coloring, right? So you can take something healthy and by ultra processing it, you can turn it into something less healthy. Now, what do those things actually do? Perhaps one of the most profound things that ultra process uh, uh, f- foods do and, and these types of additives to foods is they mess with our gut microbiome. They destroy our gut health. And our healthy microbiome, as we now know, gut health is so important for not only immunity and lowering inflammation, lowering inflammation counters the harm of excess body fat right? Now you're starting to lose control over balancing the harms of extra body fat. But it turns out our our gut microbiome also helps to control our metabolism, our healthy metabolism. So when you knock that system, that ecosystem of gut bacteria out of control, now you're actually messing with the hard drive and the operating system uh, of of, of our metabolism as well. So again, I think eating ultra processed foods, and by the way, even in healthy traditional societies that have become modernized, modern Japan, modern China, modern Mediterranean countries. You know, when you study the effects of that ultra processing, uh, you see that their health is also starting to to start to flag and fail. You know, there's a whole section inside of the book where you go through the health systems, which you're so known for, and you talked about last time on the podcast and how they, the health defense systems, and you talk about the latest research of how fat, excess fat specifically, damages those systems and can hijack. You just broke that down for the microbiome, right? And and actually, I have one more question about the microbiome, but we also have the other systems as well. I'd love to walk through those for a little sure. bit. Uh, the DNA protection system, the immune system, we'll, we'll walk through them all. So in the microbiome system, one of the things that you talked about was that they studied, there was a twin study and they looked at the microbiome. Can you chat a little bit more of that if you remember it offhand? 
Well, I mean, there's a number of twin studies looking at the microbiome, but they actually take a look at twins. There's a study that looked at twins looking at those twins who actually became uh, heavier, overweight or obese versus uh, thin. And they actually found striking differences between the microbiome. And other studies have actually delved deeper to take a look at differences between the microbiome of people who are uh, heavy, obese versus people that are um, uh, thinner or leaner in their body com composition. And what they're finding, I'm sure there are many, many differences that have yet to be discovered. But one of the most striking things that they found one bacteria, the Acromancia mucinophila, um, which is a standout bacteria. I've talked about it in my first book. I've been uh, talking about the research. It's relevant to cancer as well. It turns out this one bacteria and don't forget, there's 39 trillion. So we're just we're just at the beginning of this research uh, discovery of what uh, who, what what bacteria are important and why. But acromancia keeps on coming back up. All right, and acromancia seems to actually be um, present in people who have healthy body compositions, leaner in nature, and it's almost missing and is sometimes absent in people who are overweight or obese. And so, you know, uh, this is a correlation. Correlation is not causation, but it shows you that there's something going on with this bacteria. This bacteria, by the way, is also protective against diabetes, uh, which of course is the end stage of metabolic syndrome, which is connected to body fat, which is connected to body composition. So again, you're starting to put together the clues, right? This is a big mystery of science trying to figure out what, what this is. This guy keeps on coming up. And acromancia also protects against um, inflammatory diseases like uh, Alzheimer's and obesity. Uh, it also protects against cancer. It ups your healthy immune system and lowers harmful uh, inflammation. And so again, uh, we're beginning to discover that uh, from you know starting from twin studies, but then taking a look at and doing a deep dive and trying to figure out what are the patterns of what people who are heavy and excess body fat versus people who are lean. What are some of those differences and are, are there any key players that are standouts? And acromancia seems to be one of them. Yeah, I think I learned from you originally that healthy people who have the, what looks to be, again, it's correlation, the right amount of acromancy in their body, it could be up to 5% of their total bacterial composition. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, so- So it's not just like we're talking about one little strain that's kind of popping up a little bit there, but it's a significant amount, whether it's five, four, whatever- it, it is, does seem to be like a flagship strain inside of the gut. That's right. It is It is one of the core bacteria that we need to have. Another one is lactobacillus. You know, there's many different kinds of lactobacillus, but lactobacillus ruteri start, seems to be one of these core strains that because time and time and again, the research has shown lactobacillus helps wound healing, helps control your metabolism, lowers excess body fat, protects against colon cancer and breast cancer. You know, when you start adding all these different observations and correlations up between lactobacillus ruteri, acromancia mucinophila, at least in my book as a researcher, you know, we have to flag them. You know, these are the ones you want to put on your refrigerator magnet to say, you know what, if we had a choice of actually trying to grow these bacteria, these are the ones you actually want to have. And this really comes back to the idea of, okay, people are asking, well, what can we do? Do we need to be on a fancy probiotic? Do we need to do this? And part of your book in this microbiome system section, talking about both the damage that fat, excess fat can have on it, but also the way that we can combat that and revert it is these principles that are very straightforward, hard to sometimes put into action for people when they don't have the education. This is why I'm so excited about your book, your work, people like you that are out there, because when you get the background, when you understand the importance you literally see how every bite you take is helping you grow a healthier body. So a couple of the classic things that you include inside of there, but you really go deep into the science is diversity of plant matter and its relationship with things like short chain fatty acids. Just talk about that for a second. Right. Okay. So our gut bacteria, uh, really, there's about the same number of bacteria in our body as our human cells. So we're 50-50 human and bacteria all packaged together, all walking around in clothes. And one of the things that we provide humans as our as humans, we provide our bacteria, we provide them room and board. The room we provide them actually is in our gut, mostly in our colon. We get some in our skin and orifices and things like that. But a lot of it actually is in our in a place called the cecum. It's actually a little pouch uh, in your colon. Uh, and most of the bacteria are actually there. So that's where they live. That's their 
room. And the board we give them is the food that we eat. So whenever we're eating, we're eating not for just ourselves, we're eating for 49 trillion bacteria. It's kind of like, you know, the pregnant mom saying, I'm eating for two. Well, here, we're at, all of us are actually eating for 49 trillion plus one. And that's us. <laughs> and so what a lot of people don't realize is that the food that we eat, that we whatever we choose to, to put on our dinner plate, uh, whenever you're sitting down for food, our human bodies will absorb the nutrients in the upper part of the digestive system. And then anything that we don't absorb gets sent downstairs. Our bacteria get the, they get the leftovers, all right? And a lot of those leftovers in plant-based foods, the broccolis, the, the fruits and vegetables, the legumes, are dietary soluble fiber. So soluble fiber um, and some of the polyphenols that are also prebiotic uh, in nature, they feed the gut microbiome. They eat it up. That's their dinner. All right. And when they're well fed, well cared for, okay, with soluble fiber from plant based foods primarily and different ones, they like the different polyphenols. They like the different kinds of, but you know, like you, you know, uh, you want to be able to feed them diversity. They pay us back and they pay us back for room and board. Like they pay the rent. Uh, and they, the way they pay it back actually is by, per, per, by creating something called short chain fatty acids. These are the metabolites produced by our gut bacteria that they just send into our bloodstream. These short chain fatty acids help our blood lipids become more normal. They control our blood pressure, help us speed up our wound healing. They actually also communicate with our brain as well. Short chain fatty acids lower inflammation. And so our gut bacteria release these short chain fatty acids really in response to being well fed and well cared for. Now, why is that important? It's because now, again, this is all about the choices that we make, right? So you can make a good choice, plant-based food mostly. If you make a bad choice, ultra-processed foods, what you're doing with these artificial colorings and flavorings and preservatives, we poison our gut microbiome. When we poison the bacteria, it's like pouring Drano down to, to poison the, the ecosystem. You know, you got some floaters down there, right? They're not happy. They're dying. And so they're not, number one, they're not making those short-chain fatty acids, but even worse, some of the bacteria, the bad actors can actually over, start to overgrow. You can grow bad bacteria. And rather than produce mostly short chain fatty acids, that's good for our body and good for our metabolism. The bad bacteria produce toxins that get into our blood. And so this is how invisibly the choices that we make sitting at our dinner table or at a restaurant meal, you know, or at a snack bar uh, or at a vending machine, they can actually determine the fate of what our, what, what happens. Now, remember I told you, look, we're pretty resilient. So you eat, you know, some crazy nuclear colored chips every now and then, your body will bounce back from it. But it's that lifetime habit. You know, you talked about um, really how we tend to um, uh, uh, be addicted to certain kinds of foods that are engineered to make us addicted to them or the flavoring would, or change our brain or our brain, brain pattern. Now we start to destroy our gut microbiome. We derail our metabolism. Our fat starts to grow. And yeah, the fat starts to take over. It starts to reach out with its blood vessels to try to grow itself and yet not fast enough. So it becomes, it starts to die in the middle and starts to become inflamed. You can kind of see this. Like it's a, it's a, um, it is a uh, domino effect. That Cascading. Can yeah. Yeah. Ca cascade. So in a way, people are, a little right. It's a partial truth yeah. when they say as they're getting older into their mid 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond, they notice that it's harder for them to lose weight. And it may be, but what I'm hearing you say, and please correct me if I'm misunderstanding this, is that it's because the excess weight is damaging their health systems. And if your health systems continue to get damaged, they are your defense mechanisms on gaining weight, um, avoiding excess fat in the first place. So in that sense, people are right that it can feel tougher, right? But it's not just because um, our it's not because of our metabolism potential. Our metabolism potential is always there. It's not because of the number of birthday candles you're blowing out, right? All right, it's not hardwired into it. It really is. Again, you know, it's it's that idea that. If you put poor quality fuel and you mistreat your car over a long period of time, you know, you can hot rod your car around the block a couple of times, once or twice, no big deal. But if you keep on abusing that car, 
you know, it's not going to be lasting. You take it ten, now 10 years, it's not going to be driving as well as a car that's been well cared for. The difference with a car and a body, though, is that we can actually revert back. You know, the car will start to corrode. Our human bodies, and this is really, I think, the message of empowerment, is that we can actually be, be mindful to know that just how powerfully hardwired we are, we can try to restore uh, our operating system and really have it do what it what it wants to do simply by being mindful of how we eat, when we eat, uh, what we eat, and also these other lifestyle choices. What's another health system that you want to talk about in the context of how excess fat can damage it and how we can start to unwind that and actually activate that health system? All right. I'm going to tell you one that's uh, not very well known, which is people um, know stem cells by mostly associating with driving to the driving to the corner of a strip mall and getting their knees injected or their elbow injected, right? To me, as a researcher, that kind of stuff is not ready for prime time. But our body is ready for prime time. We are primed with stem cells from the time we're born. We got about 75 million stem cells that are just left over from developing in a womb, and they get stored in our bone marrow and in our other organs and our skin. And even inside our body fat, these stem cells are called out to help repair us from the inside out throughout our lives. So we are actually continuously renewed where we regenerate. And this whole idea that um, humans don't regenerate, but salamanders and starfish can is wrong. Another myth that's being overturned is that humans do regenerate. We just regenerate slowly. We can't grow back an arm or a leg or a tail, but we can actually grow back our liver. We can grow back our lungs. We can even grow back parts of our brain, which is really, really amazing. And definitely we regrow back our, our nerves. The thing about our stem cells in our body fat that can affect our metabolism is that the, our body fat does contain stem cells. And remember I told you, if you have too much energy, too much fuel, too much food, uh, too many calories, but, but your body's going to have to stuff the, the fuel into the, into the fuel tanks, so the fat. If, you don't, if that's completely loaded up, now you got to create more fat. You know what it creates it from? Stem cells. Mm. All right. So, so our stem cells and our fat are there as reserves if we need to actually create more fuel tank. But it turns out that you can do some good things with those um, fat adipose cells as well. I read about um, some research that is being done. I took part in some of this as well. Uh, cardiologists are working with plastic surgeons in liposuction to remove fat and to identify and isolate out the stem cells from body fat. So here's how it works. Do liposuction, you get this uh, jar of yellow stuff, which is uh, fat. And you put that, pour that into a, a tube and you spin it in a centrifuge, which makes it go round and around and around. And, with, and what happens when you spin it like that is that the cells, the stem cells will clump to the bottom. The fat will float to the top. You stop the machine. It's not spinning anymore. You pour off the fat and the stem cells are what you have left. Cardiologists are taking those stem cells and they're putting it with a little saline, a little salt water, and they're injecting it into the heart. Mm. Okay. And because it's not in the fat, it's now in the heart, it will create new heart tissue. All right. And uh, one of the um, remarkable things uh, in my book I talk about is that they're doing the same thing with spinal cord injury. Now it's research only, but it actually is in humans. Um, there was a really famous case of a, uh, somebody who, a young person who injured his uh, spinal cord at the neck level became quadriplegic. And um, what they did is they actually took his body fat spun it down exactly the same way, got the stem cells, and then took his stem cells and injected it into the spinal cord. And he was able to regain movement, which is really, really amazing. I'm telling you this to show you how powerful stem cells are. And if you imagine them in the heart or in the spinal cord, that might be something that the medical community is going to be able to use in the future. That's very promising. But that just shows you how powerful the stem cells can be inside the fat itself. You don't want to be triggering those stem cells to grow new fat by eating more food and overloading your system. Those guys can really fuel up your fat really fast, which is why sometimes when we see massive weight gain, you know, like it, it and quickly weight gain, it's partly due to these stem cells. So what's really important is that you can tame these stem cells. There are foods that can actually you can eat that will actually start to divert the stem cells by telling the stem cells, "Hey, buddy, don't be making more fat. Let's let's stay let's stay calm. All right, let's just stay quiet. Don't act out. Don't make more fat." And that's really an, another example of a health defense system that, on one hand, could be really powerful to help uh, recharge, renew certain body parts that we might want to have, but we have to tame it. 
Body fat is not bad. It's good. You, but what we want to do is we want to respect it, but we do, do need it to be tamed. We cannot allow it to actually go uh, haywire. Hey, YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. It's probably not one day's worth of exposure that's going to kill you. It's going to require, you know, 10 years to 30 years of exposure. It's going to be multiple chronic exposures, but ultimately it's going to kill you.